about five minutes. Could I also please call Ms. Gumbi to the front? Could I kindly ask that everybody be seated so we can start the program in about one minute? Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Lawson, please take your seat. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Can we all settle down, please? The chairs are very noisy. So can I ask that, uh, Lawson, you can come and sit here. Yeah, come and sit here. I'm looking for my other speaker. Zakira, is she here? Okay. Just. That's where we. And where's Lukon? So he will be here in time for the funeral. So I really need just stay and listen, just to give a sense of. Okay, we are going to start. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, one of my speakers. I think if we all just get the chair in the right position. Stay, come and sit here, or sit next to Lawson. Okay, now we can start. The lady of the moment has arrived. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Um, and thank you very much for attending this endeavor. 
very, very important issue that we are going to discuss today. Uh, this endeavor is convened by a number of organizations, and uh, those include my vote counts, CASAC, Rivonia Circle, the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation, and Defend Our Democracy. Some of you joined us when uh, we Defend Our Democracy convened a conference uh, in July. Yeah, I think it was. And so this INDABA follows that Defend Our Democracy conference for democratic renewal and change, which placed emphasis on the need for meaningful, and we mean meaningful, electoral reform in order to ensure accountability of elected representatives. The Defend Our Democracy program of action references this very important issue of accountability. And the program of action, I hope that uh, all of you have it, otherwise it will be distributed to all of you. The right to vote and to be voted is easily one of the most important of the fundamental rights in our Constitution because so much flows from that. Other than the fact that many South Africans paid the ultimate price, and not only South Africans but some from amongst our neighboring nations, paid the ultimate price for us to be able to exercise this right, we know that it is the elected representatives that can decide and that will decide the fate of this country. Many people talk about us having a constitutional democracy, which is great, but we know that if we go wrong, with the elected representatives, that constitution can be changed, provided they get the correct majority. If we have the wrong elected representatives, we may see the return of the death penalty. If we have the wrong elected representatives, we may see a removal of the socioeconomic rights. We have the wrong elected representatives we will see the removal of the right to health care, to decent education, and all of that. So the life of the nation literally rests in the hands of these elected representatives. I hope that the participants in this endeavor understand the fundamental nature of what we are going to discuss today. We know that there are those who look at this electoral reform process from a formalistic approach. They adopt a formalistic approach. They adopt a logistics approach. They are worried about the how we are going to give effect to it, but not understanding the, just the fundamental nature of the right, that your approach should be one that Excuse me, I should have switched this off. I'm not on duty today. It's my boss's PA, one and only boss, Faisal. <laughs> there are people who, who approach this, as I say, from a, from a formalistic way. What, how can this be? You know, and, and I dare say, especially, uh, Sister Lope, you are here, especially people who administer elections, they look at it from an inconvenience point of view. If we adopt this route, it's going to be too inconvenient. And, uh, but not understanding that it's not about <laughs> whether it's convenient or not. It's not about logistics and formal processes. It's about the exercise of a right. And in the, the reason why the Constitutional Court agreed 
to, to look at the new nations matter. Amongst others, Judge Tisman Langa says, it's because this matter before the Constitutional Court raises novel and far-reaching issues. So even the Constitutional Court understood the rights part of this uh, electoral reform argument. Those of you who were around, there are some who are young, like uh, Zakira and Dudu Etzang. Those of you who were around in the lead up to the 1999 elections would remember that the Electoral Act was amended in October, 16th October, actually, when that was amended, 1998, in order to enforce the requirement that any person who wants to vote must have a green barcoded ID. At that time, there were, I think, over four million people who didn't have green barcoded ID. And the Constitutional Court had to wrestle with that matter. The new National Party, as it was called then, brought the first case in, in Cape Town. And the Democratic Party, as it was called then, brought a case in Pretoria. And both cases were heard together in the Constitutional Court around that requirement. The IEC at that time said there is no way <laughs> that we are going to be able to, to meet the requirement of ensuring that everyone has the right to vote because we don't think that the Department of Home Affairs has got the capacity to issue these green barcoded IDs. The Constitutional Court decision was handed down on the 13th of April, 1999, less than two months before the elections on 2 June, 1999. And the skies didn't fall. The AEC had to open registration again, have another round of registration, and the elections went ahead very well. The decision having been handed down less than two months before the election on something as important as who is going to vote, who's going to produce what document in order to vote. So we, it's not, uh, I know that the IEC has raised the issue and Sai Mamabulu is going to talk to us later about how much time they need to give effect to this. All I'm saying is that if they recognize that this is a matter of fundamental rights, I think they can come to the party. So I'm not going to speak more about this. Uh, we've got experts who are going to address us this morning about this issue of electoral reform. And uh, I will introduce them as they come up, but our first speaker is going to be Lawson Naidu. Lawson is the Executive Secretary of CASAC, the Council for the, for the Advancement of the South African Constitution, an organization committed to the principles of progressive constitutionalism, democracy, and the rule of law. He has held this position since CASAC's inception in 2010. During 2007 to 2008, he served as the Secretary of the presidential inquiry into the fitness of the national public prosecutions to hold office, the Ginola inquiry. He previously held a position of special advisor to the Speaker of National Assembly, 94 to 99, and spent many years in exile in the UK, worked for the ANC there, and serving amongst others as a spokesperson of the ANC. Lawson, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sis Mujanku. Um, colleagues and friends, uh, it's quite an intimidating task to, to address this gathering this morning, especially in the presence of some of the people in this room um, who know a lot more about us than I do. Uh, Mum Brigelia Baum, who shepherded us, shepherded us through 
those early elections in the 1990s. Comrade Mavuso, who in uh, one of his incarnations was the Director General of Home Affairs, the department that uh, has responsibility uh, for elections, uh, and many others in this room. Sai Mamabolo, I don't know if Comrade Vali Musa is here. Um, but we, we are blessed to have those people in this room, and I think it reflects, as this Mujanku has said, the importance of the discussions that we are going to be having today. They really <coughs> strike at the very center of our constitutional democracy, its sustainability, and most importantly, public confidence in it. I want to start with a question that was posed in the Fansail Slabbert report in 2003, which I'm going to refer to again as well. But in that report, it posed a question where it said, it is common cause that an electoral system cannot resolve the problem of political accountability. But can one electoral system make a greater contribution than another? And that's really the issue that we are confronting here today. We recall the iconic images of snaking queues of voters in the 1994 elections, which remain an abiding memory of those elections 28 years ago, even though many people in this room may not have been there. It was the crowning moment of our national attainment of freedom from the racism and brutality of apartheid. It marked a new dawn for the burgeoning rainbow people long before that term came to be associated with the current president. Heady days indeed, as president-to-be Nelson Mandela ushered us in, into a constitutional democracy in those historic elections. There was insufficient time from the conclusion of the negotiations that led to the adoption of the interim constitution to put in place anything beyond the closed party list system, largely because it is a simple, inclusive system that initially did not require voters to be registered, but merely to present an identity document or some other form of re recognized identification to enable one to vote. As Sis Mujanku has said, that changed ahead of the 1999 elections when a barcoded ID document was required. So in addition to that pragmatism of choosing that electoral system in 1994, the pure uh, proportional representation list system is also the most inclusive system that one can have, and it fitted in very well with the overriding priority of that time, which was to ensure as broad a representation in Parliament as well as the Constitutional Assembly. This was to be the building blocks for reconciliation and nation building. Recognizing the unique circumstances that led to this outcome, the final Constitution required that an electoral system be introduced through the enactment of national legislation. This led Cabinet in 2002 to establish the electoral task team that I referred to, which was chaired by the late Professor Frederick Fensel Slabbert. They were required to draft legislation for an electoral system for the 2004 national and provincial elections. That task team submitted its report in January of 2003, having, and regrettably, the report, though it was published, was not considered by Parliament at all. The Cabinet merely opted to accept the recommendation of the minority report of that task team and, clo and the closed party list electoral system was then entrenched in legislation. Allow me once again to quote from that report of the electoral task team. And they said, from the outset, the task team operated under a severe time constraint. When it was appointed, 
only two, and a, two to two and a half years remained before the 2004 elections. Any election system that would require extensive re-demarcation and voter education would simply be too impractical for consideration, no matter how suitable it might otherwise be in the South African situation. The task team was aware of the resulting tension and it had to do the best it could within the time available. Those of us that have been following the recent process through Parliament, this would sound very, very familiar indeed. The majority report proposed 69 multi-member constituencies in which 300 MPs would be elected from those uh, constituencies and a compensatory co closed national list of 100 MPs. Each constituency would elect between three to seven MPs depending on its population size. Eight members of the electoral task team subscribed to that view of the majority report. Interestingly, given what I said just now, they also proposed transitional arrangements or what uh, is now being referred to as a sunset clause in that draft legislation. And they say in the report, and again I quote, Parliament cannot be expected to pass a new Electoral Systems Act much earlier than a year before the next national and provincial elections, which would leave very little time for political parties to adjust their processes for compiling candidate lists. While balloting and voter education should not present pr problems to the electorate, there will be little time to fully acquaint voters with the intentions and principles of the new system as part of a democracy education program. For the 2004 national and provincial elections, it is therefore proposed to retain the current situation, a situation of nine multi-member constituencies uh, responsible for the election of 200 members of the National Assembly, supplemented by an additional 200 members drawn from a national list. It is, however, best to deal now with the question of an electoral system, which will serve us beyond the next 18 months and to handle the immediate practical realities of the 2004 elections by means of transitional arrangements. To do otherwise would be to nullify the present effort and to start the debate afresh after the 2004 elections. The reason I've quoted that in full because it is really pertinent to the discussions that we're having today. Because we've got to, at the end of these discussions today, try and craft a way forward for us where we can hold the 2024 elections in a lawful manner and yet make provision for meaningful electoral reform. The minority report of that electoral task team proposed that the current system be retained, which is the system that we are still using, the closed party list system, and that minority view was supported by four members of the task team. And now history repeats itself as government has now accepted the minority view of the Ministerial Advisory Committee and that has put us in the situation we're in. I'm not going to deal with that because I'm going to leave that to Sitem Bile, to, who was a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, to speak on the, on the detail of the two reports in that, in, that emanate from there. So as I said, the Mbeki administration had enshrined the cur current electoral model into law Despite a warning from President Mandela in his final speech to Parliament in 1999 when he said, and I quote, we do need to ask whether we need to re-examine our electoral system so as to improve the nature of our relationship as public representatives with the voters. That was Nelson Mandela in 1999 already saying when you review this you need to, to really think about the electoral system that we need in South Africa. There have been several other recommendations over the years that the electoral system be changed, and these have all been ignored. These include the Independent Panel Assessment of Parliament in 2009, which stated in its report, and again I quote, 
the panel deliberated at length on the impact of the party list electoral system on various aspects of Parliament's work. It was noted that the party list system tends to promote accountability of members of Parliament to their political parties rather than to the electorate. The power of political parties to remove their members from Parliament also tends to discourage the expression of individual viewpoints as opposed to party political views. The panel recognized that, an, that alternative electoral systems also have drawbacks, but the panel strongly recommends that Parliament debates the relative mer merits of various electoral systems and considers the impact of these systems on the institution's ability to give expression to its constitutional mandate. The view of the panel is that the current electoral system should be replaced by a mixed system which attempts to capture the benefits of both the constituency-based and proportional representation electoral systems. Again, it's an issue that those of us in this room today are putting forward once again, and yet Parliament was told this back in 2009. Next came the high-level panel on the assessment of key legislation and the acceleration of fundamental change in 2017, which was chaired by former President Khalema Motlante. That report states, effective parliamentary oversight is dependent on members of parliament acting in the best interests of the people of South Africa without fear, favor, or prejudice. In that context, the panel has considered the role of the electoral system in moderating the extent to which the public are able to hold their representatives to account. At the heart of whether government delivers, delivers on its constitutional mandate and whether Parliament legislates to bring about change and exercise effective oversight are issues of accountability. The panel proposes ways to deepen the relationship between constituencies and their representatives so as to assure more direct accountability to the public. And then most recently, the report of the State Capture Commission in reflecting on Parliament's failure to take action when wrongdoing was exposed. And this was an issue that Chief Justice Zondo uh, dwelt upon in his address to the uh, News 24 uh, session yesterday on, on the record. And he highlighted the failings of Parliament to take appropriate action. And therefore, the Zondo report recommended that Parliament should consider whether introducing a constituency-based but PR electoral system would enhance the capacity of MPs to hold the executive accountable, and that consideration be given to the majority recommendation of the electoral task team in 2003. So you can see a thread in all of these uh, reports and assessments that have been done over the year with where there's been a scrutiny about Parliament, one of the proposals that's always made is change the electoral system to enable the voters to have a closer relationship with their representatives. In respect of what Zondo has uh, said, I want to use one example to illustrate the point very sharply. Zuki Swaranto, was the chairperson of the Public Enterprises Committee, which, albeit belatedly, conducted an inquiry into what was going on at ESCOM in 2017 and issued its report in 2018. Ranto was brave and fearless in the face, face of threats and intimidation to her and her family by those who were opposed to this inquiry. Nevertheless, the committee produced an excellent report that was passed on to the Zondo Commission. Zuki Swaranto is no longer an MP. She did not make the ANC list for the 2019 elections. That shows you the hold that the party has over, over their representatives. And if you step out of line, you are removed. That is what the current system gives us. There is a deep reluctance by political parties 
both big and small, to change the status quo, albeit for different reasons. The bigger parties want to hang on to the control that they have over their MPs, and others will speak to this. As I've illustrated, you fail to toe the party line, and you will be removed from office. MPs therefore effectively prostitute their oath of office to the party that puts them there rather than acting in the best interests of the people and the country. What of the smaller parties? The current PR list system allows them a, lev a level of representation that they may otherwise not have under a different system. So they too benefit from the current electoral system. All of this demonstrates the decreasing levels of confidence in elections and in our democracy in South Africa. And if we just look at the statistics of voter turnout at elections in recent years, it, is, it should be a deep cause for concern for all of us. And especially that young people seem to be opting out. Of, in the 2019 elections, of the 9 million people who had not registered to vote, 6 million of those were aged between 18 and 29. And that number has probably increased in the three years since then. And it is because of the kind of electoral system that we have that detaches people from uh, what, what happens in Parliament primarily and what happens in our society more generally. And that's something that we need to turn around. And that's why the reform of the electoral system is such a critical aspect of allowing us to facilitate the re-engagement of people with our politi uh, the politics of the country. Not necessarily by becoming members of political parties, but engaging in the political discourse and being able to feel confident that when you go to the ballot box, your vote, is, your vote does count and that it's going to make a difference. And that's why this debate is so important. Given the inherent conflicts that the political parties have in choosing the rules of the game, because in Parliament it is the political parties that are determining the electoral system, the voters yet again are left on the margins. And it is no wonder that people like Nkebisi Jonas has postulated the idea of a referendum to determine the electoral system. I'm not necessarily advocating that, but using it as an example to illustrate why it is important for, pe for people, ordinary people, to be involved in these discussions. Because it should be that it is the voters that determine the electoral system, whether through a comprehensive and satisfactory public participation process, or perhaps through a referendum. But as voters, we, the electoral system is ours. It doesn't belong to political parties. It is there to facilitate our participation in, the, in, in choosing our representatives. And therefore, we should have a say in that system itself. In the earlier round of public submissions and oral hearings in Parliament in, I think it was in February, March this year, all but what, all except one submission rejected the bill as it was currently uh, tabled in January this year. The one exception was Kosatu, which supported the bill as it currently stands. So despite all of the submissions that many of us in this room made to the Portfolio Committee, those submissions to consider the majority uh, report of the Ministerial Advisory Committee was summarily rejected without even debate. It really is time for the people to speak, to be heard, and to collectively de determine our democratic future. The question then is, as I wind up, is what can we do? And I think this is the subject of the discussions for today, 
but I just want to end by, by highlighting or summarizing where we are now in the process of the, um, the passage of this piece of legislation through Parliament. So we know that uh, this round of uh, engagement on the issue stems from the judgment of the Constitutional Court in the New Nation Movement case in June 2020. It gave Parliament two years to remedy the Electoral Act uh, due to various delays that have been uh, blamed by the Constitutional Court, no less, on both the Minister of Home Affairs as well as on Parliament. Uh, Parliament was unable to meet that deadline and had to seek an extension which has now been granted to the 10th of December this year. There have been lots of discussions within the Portfolio Committee, um, serious engagement with the Electoral Commission which has uh, tabled its views on aspects of the draft bill before Parliament and significant changes have been made. But ultimately, um, the bill as it currently stands is not fit for purpose. Because what the judgment of the Constitutional Court in the New Nation Movement case said is that the current electoral system is unconstitutional because it does not allow independent candidates to contest national and provincial elections, as they are entitled to do at a local government level, where we have constituencies, we have wards. And, you know, the, the majority report of the Ministerial Advisory Committee is essentially to replicate that local government model at a national and provincial level. So it's a system that people are familiar with. We use it in local government elections. It won't take a lot of voter education to be able to implement that, yet it has been re rejected. But because the nature of the case that was before the Constitutional Court was simply about the, the rights of independent candidates, the judgment is restricted to that. And what Parliament has done is to take a narrow view and say, okay, how do we satisfy the judgment um, by doing it as little as possible? So they've just tweaked the current system to, to accommodate independent candidates. But the difficulties, the practical difficulties that others will speak about later on, highlight, highlight how unsuitable the list system is in accommodating independent candidates. Um, the reality is that you, if you are going to be able to effectively accommodate independent candidates, you need a constituency system of some sort. Whether it be a single member constituency or even as the Fancel Slabbard report recommended, a multi-member constituency. It creates, firstly, a closer nexus between MPs and the electorate in that constituency. And secondly, it, it, it gives independent candidates a better chance of winning seats than the current system does. And again, the mathematical experts will explain the formulas that are used and why it is unfair on um, independent candidates. The current draft before Parliament, the current bill, says that each of the provinces will constitute a constituency, pretty much as they do now. Um, the nine provinces, you know, we have a, a, a regional to, a, to national uh, ballot and then we have a national to national ballot, is how we currently choose. That doesn't change in what is being proposed uh, in the current bill. It merely says that independent candidates can contest within a province and will be competing against you know, the, uh, the resources that big political parties have. That surely is not a level playing field and undermines a fundamental principle of our constitution is in that we need to have not only regular elections but those elections need to be free and fair. And it can very easily be argued that the bill that is currently before Parliament does not facilitate free and fair elections. So I think what happened yesterday, just to, to round off, 
the National Assembly approved a report from the Portfolio Committee on Home Affairs which has expanded the mandate of the committee because following the last round of public consultations in, in February and March, significant changes have been made to the bill, what are called material changes, which therefore need to be... This morning, the National Assembly uh, published uh, a call for submissions uh, from interested parties and the public at large to make submissions on a series of amendments that's tabulated uh, and which um, we will go through uh, later on in the morning. We have two weeks to respond to that by um, Friday the 16th of, of September. And we need to do so, and we need to do so, I would argue, in a concerted way, and hopefully we can uh, come out of today's session with an agreement that the people represented in this room today uh, will be able to uh, submit a, make a joint submission to that committee, highlighting the deficiencies um, in the current bill, and yet again pleading with them to have a proper debate on alternative electoral systems that will really satisfy both the spirit as well as the letter of the Constitutional Court judgment and the various proposals that I've outlined earlier that have come over the years urging Parliament to consider some form of constituency-based system. So I hope we're going to have a constructive day of, of discussions and uh, I wish you all well and let us come out of today with a strong uh, call from civil society organizations that we cannot trust the process in parliament uh, at the moment. Political parties have vested interests and it is the people of South Africa who need to determine how our democracy unfolds, not just for the 2024 elections, but for many more elections to come after that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lawson. Uh, I think the English have a saying that if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And, and it's important for us to show the, not only our representatives in parliament, but South Africans, why this system is broken and needs fixing. Um, Lawson has, has just highlighted a few of <laughs> what has happened. Um, you know, the, the redeployment of Zuki Saranto, <laughs> just as an example. Uh, we know what happened around the, the fire pool, you know, we, we are looking at it playing out again around Palapala, uh, where political parties just close ranks. As I was driving here this morning, I was listening to people on the East End explaining the kind of service or non-service they are receiving from the DA <laughs> that, uh, and the DA counselor was challenging people who explained their lived, their really lived experience that, you know, our, our, there's no um, uh, municipal services in our areas and each one explained, I live in this place, we've hired private people to do it, I live here, we've all real lived experience, and I think the DA was just nullifying people's real lived experience. And, uh, and, and so I, I think, I, I don't understand why the political parties don't understand that this, this system is broken. I mean, it, it was good for purpose when it started, and it worked very well, but they themselves can see that it's no longer serving the purpose for which it was established. And, and I don't understand people who just will keep doing the same thing over and over again when they can see that it's not working. Um, I'm sure psychologists have a, an explanation for that. So we, we just have to make people understand that we are not saying it's their fault, you know. 
It's, it's, not a, it's not a blame game. It's just to say this system is not saving the people as it should. But anyway, um, I'm now going to call upon, uh, I'm not used to calling you doctor, <laughs> stay better, <laughs> it's just stay. <laughs> You know, I, ageism comes into it, you know. But Dr. Mbete is a lecturer in the Department of Political Sciences at the University of Pretoria, where she lectures international relations and South African politics. She's also an associate fellow of the Center for Governance Innovation at the University of Pretoria. She has a doctorate from the same university on the subject of South Africa's foreign policy during its two elected terms in the UN Security Council. She has published on the EFF in accredited journals. I'm sure she will tell us more about their view on this electoral reform. <laughs> and uh, she is an outstanding scholar. She was a visiting scholar in a number of universities, and she's a 2019 Open Society Foundation Democracy Fellow. She was part of this panel, and uh, we are very proud of you, Svite, because it's quite clear that, uh, um, you know, our money educating you did not go to waste. <laughs> Over to you, Dr. Mbete. Thanks, Ma. Uh, it is always weird speaking at things like this, uh, on the one hand with people who raised you, and at the other hand with one of my first bosses, basically. Um, thank you. When I was a baby intern uh, working at Adasa, so it's always quite cool to be here doing things like this. Uh, Thanks so much for inviting me to be here to speak to you on um, what's going on uh, with the electoral reform. I was asked specifically to uh, talk around the options um, and kind of how we got here. Um, I was asked the, the options for electoral reform now and in the future. Um, Greetings to everybody. Anthlope, hi. Uh, all of the big and wonderful people who are here, um, but also all of the young activists who are actually going to make this right. Um, it's really cool to, to be here with all of you. Um, so I was asked to, I was sort of given four or five big things to talk about. Uh, the first one was the different options and where they come from for electoral reform. Uh, the second, the historical process that led to the minority and majority views in the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Um, the current process underway, which options should see, would suit South Africa and, and then to reflect on any other reforms. Thankfully, Lawson has done a lot of the background historical work for me, so I don't have to do that. Um, and that actually allows me to just jump straight into um, the discussion on substantively uh, what are the options in terms of the reform, because I think that's what we need to go out of here with, is an idea of if we're going to change this thing, well, we have to change this thing, what is it actually going to look like? Um, and so what I want to do is to provide a basis for us to have that discussion. Um, and I'm going to begin by setting out the binding constraints for any conversation we're going to have around electoral reform. And those binding constraints come from the Constitution. Now, we've already got a mammoth task in front of us in terms of, of, of amending the Electoral Act. We could add to that mammoth task the amendment of the Constitution. I advise that we don't try to do that right now. 
So the binding constraints in terms of the Constitution are threefold. The first one is that the Constitution in Section 1 of the Founding Provisions stipulates that South Africa must have a multi-party system. The exact wording of it is the Republic of South Africa is one sovereign democratic state founded on the following values, universal adults amongst them, universal adult suffrage, a national common voters' role, regular elections, and a multi-party system of democratic government to ensure accountability and responsiveness and openness. Now, what that means is that many parties must be able to compete for power and South Africa must not have a two-party or a one-party system. I raise it as the first binding constraint because it was an issue that came up in the New Nation judgment. There were three judgments. There were two um, majority judgments and there was one uh, dissenting judgment. The two majority judgments, one of them was authored by Justice Mazlanga, the second one by Justice Jafter, and the dissenting judgment was uh, Justice Froneman. He was the only dissenting judge. And the, the, the Mazlanga and Jafter ones, pretty similar. The only thing is that the Jafter judgment deals more with freedom of association. Uh, whereas, uh, which is section 18, the Mazanga one deals more with issues around political rights, which is section 19. But the Froneman judgment, which said that, um, which argued that constitutionally there is no requirement in the constitution for individuals to be able to contest elections as individuals. Justice Froneman says that there are frequent references in the Constitution to South Africa as a party system, multi-party system, which implies that in the Constitution, the, the vision set out in the Constitution is that elections are contested by political parties. Justice Madlanga disagrees with that and says that the references to a multi-party system in the Constitution are merely there to explain that South Africa must never be a one-party state. It is not a, an, an injunction on the unit of participating in an election, right? that different kinds of units can participate in an election, individuals, political parties, social movements. And so that's, his inter that's the interpretation of multi-party system, right? So that's the first constraint. The second constraint that we have to deal with is that South Africa is a parliamentary democracy. It is not a presidential democracy despite the fact that we call our president a president. We are a Westminster system. And what that means is that the head of government is, comes to power through the legislature. We do not elect a head of government separately, like they do in the United States, or Namibia, or Zimbabwe, or Zambia, or Kenya that just had an election. The head of state and government is elected by parliamentarians. We, as the voters, elect parliamentarians. We don't elect the president, or the mayor, or a premier of a province. And that is set out in section 86 of the Constitution, that concerns how the president is elected, and it says at its first sitting after its election, and whenever necessary to fill a vacancy, the National Assembly must elect a woman or a man from among its members to be the president. 
Section 128 uh, of the Constitution, um, which relates to provinces and to electing a premier at its first sitting. After its election, the provincial legislature must elect a, a woman or a man from among its members to be the premier of the province. So whatever system of electoral reform that we envision now, unless we want to amend the Constitution, cannot have direct election of the president. Of course, we may want to have direct election of the president, and Lukona, I can see you looking at me from the back there, because it's Lukona's big hobby horse, just as Zondo put it in his report. So yes, we can, eventually. But in terms of this immediate process, if we want to directly elect the president, we will have to amend Section 86 of the Constitution. So whatever electoral system we want must be immediately directed at how do we elect the members of parliament, because it is the members of parliament that are then going to elect a president. The final binding constraint I want to raise is proportional representation. The Constitution states that, and this is in section 46 of the Constitution that deals with the election of the National Assembly, and section 105, which deals with the election of provincial legislatures. Section 46, the National Assembly consists of no fewer than 350 and no more than 400 women and men elected as members in terms of an electoral system that results in general in proportional representation. The same is repeated for provincial elections. So in the Constitution, it states that any electoral system that we adopt must be a proportional one of some kind. Now, proportional representation systems, what that means is proportional representation systems are intended to distribute seats in a legislature in proportion to the support a party receives in the polls. It's based on the idea that a legislature must reflect the composition of a society. It was also something that was put in in the 1996 constitution and the people who were, there's people here who were involved in those discussions so you can ask them why. But um, it was included as part of this idea of encouraging power sharing in the governance of South Africa because proportional representation systems in general lead to coalition governments and the sharing of power. That we have not had a national coalition government between 1994 and 2022 is an anomaly. It is the exception and not the rule. What we see at local government is the way the system is supposed to work. Okay, those are binding constraints that we have to work within. Second thing that I want to talk about before I talk about the other details is how can we assess or compare electoral systems? There are three variables that I want you to think about. The first one is the ballot structure. So the structure of a ballot. What that means is does a ballot paper have the names of individual candidates or does it have the names of political parties? Does a voter receive one ballot or multiple ballots? Does a voter make a simple choice for a candidate or a party, so you just put an X next to the person that you want to vote for or the party you want to vote for? Or does a voter rank their preferences? So say, and there are voting systems that are rank choice, right? So Alaska, Sarah Palin just lost the election. 
Alaska uses a ranked choice system. So you say the person that you most want to win the election, number one, then you put a number two next to the person you, the second preference, third preference, fourth preference. There's all sorts of ways that you can do a ranked system. Ballot structure, something to consider is how many votes does a voter have? That sounds really random. Mauritius has a multi-member constituency system where voters can vote for several of the people that are running in that multi-member constituency. So there's, if there's eight members of your constituency, if a constituency has eight members, there are 40 people running to represent, to be one of the eight. Voters vote for the eight that they want. So you cast multiple, there's multiple X's. So ballot structures, how you actually vote, who you vote for, can take many different forms. And that's one of the things that we need to consider. In South Africa, at national and provincial level, you get two ballot papers as a person who's voting in a general election. One is for national, one is for provincial. Both of those ballots have the names of the political parties that are contesting. At national, national one has the names of the political parties that are contesting nationally. The provincial one has the names of the political parties that are contesting in that province. And then you've got one choice, you put an X, next to the person you, the party you want nationally, you put an X next to the party you want provincially, and then that's it. So we need to think about how do we want that to change? The second thing to consider, the second variable, is district structure. And that's another way of saying constitu constituencies. Basically, how many constituencies are there and how many seats are allocated to a constituency. Um, at local government level, we vote in wards. There's, what, 4,000 and something wards across the country. And you vote for one representative of your ward um, we each belong to a ward. You vote for the, pers for the one person that you want to represent you as a ward councillor. Um, Fancel Slabert report spoke about at national level that you can think of South Africa as 10 districts, as 10 constituencies. The nation as a whole and the nine provinces. So that at national level, we almost do have a multi-member constituency system because you have 400 members of the National Assembly representing the district that is South Africa. Um, how do we want to think about that in a reformed electoral system? Do we want to have smaller constituencies similar to what we have at local government level? Do we want those constituencies to have one representative, or do we want them to have multiple representatives? So the Fancel Slabert uh, Commission envisioned having 69 districts, 69 constituencies, and each constituency, depending on size, would be represented by three to eight people, I think it was, three to seven people. So it would be a multi-member constituency system. We need to decide what we want in a reformed system. The third consideration in terms of these variables to consider is the, electro, is the electoral formula. So is the system that we want a plurality or a majoritarian system? Basically, what we have, half of what we have at local government level is a first-past-the-post plurality system, where in your ward election, there's X number of individuals that you can vote for. 
you vote for the candidate that you want to be your ward councillor, and the winner takes all. The person who gets the most votes to be the ward councillor, whether that most votes is 46% or 58%, wins. And everybody else loses. The winner takes all. In some systems, like Kenya just had their presidential election, um, Kenya has for the presidential election a majoritarian system where the winner needs to get 50% plus one. If they get, if the two, if two highest candidates, one gets 46%, the other one gets 48%, then you need to go to a runoff election until one of them gets over 50%. You could run a constituency election in that way as well. Uh, the proportional representation system that we have that allocates seats according in proportion to the percentage of votes that a party gets is the most vote efficient system in the sense that no vote goes to waste. Every vote that is cast is counted towards the composition of the legislature, which is why you can have such broad representation um, in a legislature. When you talk about the electoral formula, you're also talking about what kind of mathematical formula is used to calculate the seat allocation. And that actually, the mathematical formula is one of the issues of contention with the uh, electoral amendment bill that's currently under consideration. Okay, so, whew, I feel like I'm giving like a first year lecture, but I hope that, <laughs> okay. Um, now, Lawson's done a great job of explaining how we all got here. So, New Nation Judgment is June of 2020, about February, Jan, Feb of 2021, Minister Aaron Mutualedi calls a few of us, um, including Vali Musa, who's here, to be the chair of a committee to help him comply with the new nation judgment. Um, constitutionally, Parliament is the only arm of state that is mandated to make electoral law. That's why the courts can say this is constitutional, this isn't. But the courts can't say South Africa must have this electoral system. Parliament is the only institution that can do that. Which is why we need to figure out how to engage with Parliament. Because <laughs> no one else can make that decision. But the South African Parliament, for reasons that elders here can explain, that I can't, because I was 10 years old in 1994, so I can't explain it, um, has gotten into a practice, our Parliament has gotten into a practice of taking its lead on making legislation from the executive. So despite the fact that the Constitutional Court said this electoral this uh, act must be amended by Parliament, Parliament waited until the Minister of Home Affairs gave them an, elect an amendment bill. Parliament could have started amending in July of 2020. It has the legal power to do so. But they waited. Um, and Shem Oldman, Musiwa Lukota, I know he's having all sorts of issues now, but I mean, he tried to to start that process with the private members bill. Anyway, um, so Minister Mutoledi approaches a bunch of people to help give recommendations of how to amend the Electoral Act to comply with the judgment. And that's how the Ministerial Advisory Committee was formed. Uh, met between March and June of 2021, 20, uh, 
I giggled when Lawson read the bit from the Fancel Slabbert Commission about not having enough time, because we also, same story, you know, you had three months to figure something out. Um, and what came out of that discussion was we could not, so what the minister had said when he briefed us initially was ideally we need you to come up with a suggestion, one suggestion, do this. As a committee, we could not reach agreement to come up with one suggestion. So we presented two. One of those suggestions, there were eight members of the committee, um, nine technically, but one of those was uh, Dr. Nomsama Suku, who is a commissioner of the IEC, so she didn't, she didn't name any preferences because she needs to implement whatever's decided. So um, to protect her integrity. Um, there were, yeah, there were eight members of the committee, so one of them didn't vote. Um, three members of the committee went with option one which was basically an option to make as minimal a change as possible to the current electoral system. So to, to change the electoral system in as much as was required to comply with the judgment, and that alone. Four of us um, advocated a more wholesale change which was a mixed member model with single member constituencies. So basically that we adapt the local government system that we have and apply it to national and to provincial. So that you have 200 of the 400 MPs in parliament be directly elected by constituencies in a first past the post system and 200 of the MPs be elected through a closed list proportional representation system, just like what we do at local government level. We proposed a few amendments or tweaks to the local government system. For example, we suggested that there should be a right of recall. So a constituency should be able to, once in an electoral term, recall its parliamentary representative if they feel that that person's not representing them properly. Um, now, the reason why those of us who voted for the option two that's been called by the, the majority report or whatever, um, the reason why we went with that is that there is no way of implementing the Constitutional Court judgment without implementing some kind of constituency system that is where the unit, the basic unit of the system is an individual, whether that individual represents themselves or represents a political party. You can't include, because you know, the, the New Nation judgment wasn't so much about independent candidates, it was about can you contest, can citizens contest elections as individuals, or do they need to join a political party to contest an election at national and provincial level? Now, for you to implement the decision that people must be able to contest as individuals. You need to have all people contesting as individuals, even the individuals that are going to be representing a political party. You can't have a system where you have political parties and then some individuals con competing with political parties as a whole. You're not dealing with apple, it's apples and bananas. And that basically is the, 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 the minimalist option or the minority option that was adopted as the basis of the electoral amendment bill has done exactly that. 
it applies the closed list proportional representation system to both parties and to individuals. It proposes that we treat provinces as constituencies, so it adopts the South Africa, the nation, as one constituency, and then the nine provinces as, re as, as constituencies, or it calls them regions. And it divides the National Assembly seat so that there's 200 regional seats and there's 200 compensatory or national seats. And it says that independents can only compete for the regional seats. They can't compete. So independents can only compete for 200 out of the 400 seats. I, I'm going to... And then, and then it has all sorts of complications around the mathematical formula. Now, I'm going to cut this short. The big problem with the bill as it currently is, even with the amendments, is that it is creating an electoral system with unlike units. It's trying to treat political parties the same as individuals, and you can't. Um, and so, so much of the substantive changes that Lawson uh, spoke about that have been made in the, in, in the parliamentary process are about trying to square that circle trying to make something make sense that actually can't. Um, so I think that we do need to engage with the, with the public participation process that's underway. Um, and I think part of that engagement needs to be making the point that this thing of trying to treat parties and people as the individuals as the same thing is the root of the problem. Um, and we need to provide a suggestion. The MAC majority report, which had the 200-200 split, um, was based on the local government elections. It is perfectly possible to have 300 MPs elected directly and then to have 100 compensatory seats. It's perfectly possible to do that. There's a lot of room for, for maneuver within that option. Um, and I think that's something that should be discussed. I'm going to close with, um, I was asked also to just indicate other political considerations other than just the electoral system. I want to just mention four. The first one is that the accountability problem that we're dealing with as a country is one around political party democracy. Our political parties, whether they're big or they're small, aren't run democratically. <laughs> the case of uh, Zugiso Aranto is, 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 is a big one. And so, and unfortunately, amending the electoral system is not going to help us deal with political party accountability or political party democracy. Second thing to consider is what the implications of having individuals running for, for, for provincial and national election is going to have on the Political Party Funding Act and the Political Party Funding Regime that was established in 2019. Third thing I think it's important to consider is boundary limitation. So if we say that we do want to have a constituency system Who's going to demarcate those boundaries? We currently have a municipal demarcations board. That demarcations board could be renamed and the legislation changed for it to just be a demarcations board that isn't just a municipal one. It's perfectly possible. Um, or do we establish a new statutory body? So, you know, who demarcates? And then, and who holds that demarcations authority accountable? And then the fourth thing I think that we need to consider and, and Mujanka, I agree with you that the IEC can do many things. The significant difference between the IEC in 1999 and the IEC in 2022 is that in 2022, the IEC has been systematically underfunded for the last 10 years. Um, in 2019, the IEC's budget was 1.2 billion rand put on the 2019 election compared to 1.5 billion rand in 2014. 
The IC is deeply under-resourced. And so we will need to also consider do we, what do we lobby for, for proper resourcing of the IC to be able to implement whatever electoral change we decide. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I felt like a University of Pretoria student <laughs> listening to the master. Um, I, you know, I, there are times when I say to the Constitutional Court judges, um, I wish I was younger and I would come and debate these cases before you. <laughs> because I don't understand how the minority judgment says when you talk about a multi-party that excludes individuals. I mean, just like, in, you know, a person, you can say a party and parties, even in a contract, that refers to people, not, uh, not necessarily political parties. But anyway, um, I'm not on the bench. So we... And also this closed party system, you know, we, I saw one person who, I hope when we come to the debate, he will, he will uh, contribute Omri there about the, the way in which within the party itself, uh, this lack of democracy in selecting the leadership within the party itself and how that system is really compromised. And, uh, and before you even get to parliament. And so let's, uh, these are some of the debates that we are going to have, uh, but, but uh, we have to make sure that the people that we call the representatives of the people are accountable to the people. Uh, we are going to move on. I am not excusing you from the high table. I'm going to call Lukona. Now, where are you? Oh, there you are. To come up here and uh, conduct the plenary discussion on this report that uh, Stembile was part of. Uh, Vali is going to join us later. He's not here yet. And so I see Lukona always moves around with, with Tessa. Tessa, you are doing something in the afternoon as, as well. So you are helping. Okay, we'll find, uh, you can sit down here. I'll move my tea. And uh, please, let's, let's, we want to come out with concrete suggestions about what we take to Parliament. You heard what Lawson said. We have a two-week window. And out of this gathering, we've got lots of NGOs here. We've got my vote counts, which are, uh, have focused a lot on this issue. Let's come up with concrete suggestions that we are going to take forward uh, to Parliament. And, and let's, let's base them, as I say, on our lived experiences to say, you know, we're not fighting any party. We're just trying to make sure that the system works best for the majority of the people in this country. So, Lukona, over to you. I can go and sit no, you can sit here. You can, you can, you can sit here, Mama. It's fine. I, I thought I was coming to a, a gathering of activists who wants to. Uh, disrupt, and now I'm seeing ties and blazers. Hey. I, I feel underdressed. <laughs> uh, a very good morning, colleagues, and thank you for uh, making time today on this very important work. I know you've listened a lot, so we are now going to get an opportunity to uh, make sure that people can say something in their teams to plenary. 
The vision behind today is to develop some degree of consensus on what do we mean by electoral reforms. In the short term, between now and December 2022. Now, I am using this short term very reluctantly because I think Parliament is not going to meet December 2022. The reopened window for written submissions that ends on the 16th of September, they re-advertised this morning. I saw an email of that re-advertisement from one of our colleagues at my vote counts. Until the 16th of September, people must comment on what they call the substantive changes to the bill since March. That means the Portfolio Committee must then deliberate on the written submissions, adopt a report, present it to the National Assembly, and then the process goes to the National Council of Provinces. And the National Council of Provinces must go through its own public participation exercise. So I'm, I'm using short term reluctantly. My logic says, come December, we will be at the Constitutional Court for an extension application. These guys are going to delay us until the 2024 elections. But that's cynical look on. Let me come back to what we are here for today. We use the term electoral reforms, but it's a loaded term, as we have already heard from our speakers. It can mean direct election of the president, as proposed by Chief Justice Raymond Zondo in his report. It can mean these complex uh, understandings of how many seats should be constituency, is it 200 constituency, 200 proportional representation. I was chatting to Ibrahim just now, Ibrahim Fakir, and he says his radical proposal is that there must be 600 members of parliament, 400 directly elected, 200 proportional representation. I'd probably agree with him if we scrapped the provinces entirely. So we've got to, because part of this is a governance reinvention work. It's not just about how many reps. So that's why I'm saying we need to develop some consensus so that when we leave today, we've got a national agenda that we go back with and we advocate for. We may differ on some areas, and that's all right. You may not believe that the president should be directly elected, and we can say, let's postpone that conversation. Let's deal with the immediate, and that immediate, I think for me, is one, how do we define constituencies? I think that's the big question that we need to grapple with. which then leads to how many constituencies should be there. Should those constituencies be single member, first past the post constituencies, or should they be multi-member constituencies? We've not really had a chance to test each other in the same room, though we have had the opportunity to listen to each other when we make presentations to different bodies. And today is to provide that opportunity to be in conversation and find each other. The truth of the matter is that in some of our work that we do at the Ravonia Circle, 
in one focus group, somebody said, why should we continue to vote for people who don't care about us? So why, why must we secure their livelihood? But that exercise does not secure us a livelihood. We have already heard from Dr. Mbete about closed lists and open lists. So if there are three seats up for grabs, a party simply contests as the party without disclosing who's going to stand for you. This list process we do with the IEC ahead of elections is helpful, but not really that much. If you go and look at the EFF lists for 2019, I think Floyd Shivambu was in the Northern Cape to national list or something bizarre like that. A Dalimpofu that you know has nothing to do with Limpopo would have been in a list though for Limpopo to national. So you abuse the process because effectively the party has full hold in terms of what must happen. The second example is the UDM. <clears throat> the UDM got two seats in 2019. One national to national list one regional to national list in the Eastern Cape. Because they wanted the deputy president of the UDM, Ngabayom Zingwangwa, to become the second person in parliament, they made everybody in the regional to national list to sign that they were not available to take up the list, the seat. These are just some of the flavors of abuse, but we are bringing it to you now. Tim, do we have a roving mic? We've got two. Can I have that book of yours? The book, not the mic. We have listened. I think it's time that the people at the front listen back and that all of us begin to be in conversation. I want to start off this way, Lawson, because both option one and option two have been unpacked. But for completeness, I'm actually going to read the summary of what we call option two, <coughs> which is the view that was just never considered. Um, I know people uh, try and put things nicely. Option two, which I think uh, Stembil supported, or oh, Dr. Mbete, sorry, I've known you too long, Stembil. <laughs> I must respect you in front of people. <laughs> Option two reads as follows, the summer. The mixed member model incorporating single member constituencies. This option entails combining the first past the post and the proportional representation, making it a mixed member proportional system, resembling the current local government electoral system albeit with some improvements. This option involves electing members of parliament from 200 single member constituencies and the remainder, which is also 200, from a single national multi-member constituency. Close quote. Option one is what has led to the bill that we have. Just by a show of hands, is there anybody who supports the current bill? You know, sometimes we make an assumption. <laughs> the democratic process is that we check. Because I would, I would love to give the mic first to that person. <laughs> no, that's dictatorial. Barry, I must just ask that person to leave. I say no. Now, option two, which is the majority view, 
Is there someone who agrees with the majority view but has slight disagreements? I see Daryl. I can't see behind Ubudi. Um, let's take those three hands for now, Tessa. One, two, three. And then I will ask another question. Yes, Daryl. Thank you. My only oh, issue... Pl please introduce yourself so that some people don't know each other. Yeah. Sure. I'm Daryl Swanepoel and I'm representing the Inclusive Society Institute. We agree in a constituency model but we agree that, but we believe it should be a multi-member constituency. And our primary motivation for that is that we believe in a diverse country such as ours, we need to ensure that you have diversified representation across the country. So if you have single seat constituencies in a province like Limpopo, for example, it is quite conceivable that one political party will hold all the constituencies, whilst the opposition political parties will then be relegated to the compensatory list. So that is why we believe in the closer to the Van Sale Slubbert model of three to seven seats uh, or, uh, per, per multi-member constituency, because you are guaranteed to have more than one political party or political parties and independents represented in smaller geographic areas. That's our main difference. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, I see Katlejo. I know your voice is intimidating generally, but please don't intimidate us. <laughs> There we go. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't want to speak the institution that I'm from, lest I be accused of representing it. Um, but I, I wanted to find out, uh, is there a possibility, for instance, if the country were to be divided into 400 constituencies, uh, and you were to use, for instance, Gauteng as an example, just bear with me, the maths might be a bit hard. If you have 526 wards with 73 seats, in the Gauteng Provincial Legislature. It would mean that each constituency has seven wards. So that person from the political party A would have to come from those seven wards. And the independent candidate as well would have to come from one of those seven wards. So is that potentially a possibility where the entire country is divided? You do away with proportional representation altogether and you have independent candidates contesting with people who live alongside them. Okay, thank you very much. Third hand um, is behind Mr. Camera. Is the table behind the camera? Tessa, Tessa, the table in front of you. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, my name is Manny de Kamara. I don't represent an organization. I used to be a member of parliament, so I know how the list gets manipulated. So I can give you a practical example. Right, I'm in favor of the mixed member system. But there is one problem with it. We still have PR lists. And PR lists is where our democracy goes to die. Right? They will be manipulated from a practical point of view. Whichever way you look at it, the party bosses decide who goes to parliament on that list. And even the people who are directly elected are going to have the ability to sway policy directly limited by the number of people the party has from the list, right? The way we fix that is with localized lists, right? It's basically the same system we use in our local government system, but instead of having PR lists, we have localized lists. And you may ask, well, what's the difference? Localized lists are determined by voters. Under this system, each constituency will have two members of parliament, the person who wins the first past the post system, and the other person will be somebody who stood in that constituency, did not win, but got enough votes to be on their party list. So the, the lists are ranked by the number of votes you got in your constituency, from highest to lowest. And if you're in an electable position, the IEC appoints you 
to that second seat. So every constituency will have two members of parliament, the person who won the most votes, and somebody got elected off their list. Why is this an improvement? Well, first of all, if you, there are three things that matter. First is accountability, proportionality, and then proximity. The further an MP is away from the voters in, a, uh, uh, in, in terms of the size of the constitu uh, constituency and number of people in that constituency, the more difficult it is for voters to access the MP. And if you have seven members in, in a multi-member district, well, there's seven degrees of distance away from the voters. Under the system I'm proposing, every constituency gets two. So if one MP is not responsive, you've got another one that can take their place and you can go, we'll listen to you. The second reason is we were talking about, um, uh, Dr. Mbete was talking about um, inter-party democracy. Well, actually, if you have localized lists, guess what? The party leaders have no say as to get to be on the list, so members will be responsive to constituents. Constituents will ensure democracy within political parties. You can, of course, have uh, primary systems and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, we must achieve three things. Accountability for every member of parliament, councillor and uh, legislature in a pro province. We must have uh, proportionality and proximity matters. It matters a great deal. Thank you so much. There's another hand at the table at the back. Next to Kelly. Okay, there are two hands in that table, I see. Okay. Hello, yes. My, my name is Omri Mahwali. I've got, uh, first I've got uh, maybe a suggestion I would have put to the committee ministerial a committee that maybe they should have put also uh, Dr. Fanzis Labat majority recommendations as the third option, so that uh, to allow the you know the, the population of South Africa to to look to consider also that uh, the two options that they've put across, uh, I, I'm I'm not satisfied with them. I don't think they'll address our problems, uh, the current problems. They won't prevent future state capture in my mind. Uh, it will still continue, there will still be state capture under such a, a two options. So I would recommend that maybe the third option should be put in place as Dr. Fanzish Labat majority recommendation. 75% of members of parliament be elected directly by the citizens, the taxpayers, the people who actually pay salaries of these politicians. Because what is important with this, all these laws is that they put the citizens far back the taxpayer is far back, and it is the taxpayer that pays the salaries of all these politicians. So I believe that the, the citizen, the taxpayer, must be at the center of any political reform, any parliamentary reform, because it is the taxpayer that pays the salaries of the president, the premier, members of parliament, the mayor, the taxpayer is paying for them. So the taxpayer should be above all, the one that decides who must go there into that office? At the moment, the taxpayer is nowhere. It's the party uh, secretaries at various headquarters. Of, uh, so these electoral laws and the proposals are still far short of in my mind. The other thing I wanted to say is that uh, uh, in these uh, current reforms, of course, the other thing is that they, there is no individual, uh, there's no independent candidate for mayor or for premier or for president in the current reforms that are proposed. So I believe that it will still be unconstitutional because an independent candidate can't stand to be a premier in any province or can't stand to be a mayor in any province or can't stand to be a president. So to be a president or premier or mayor, you still have to go through the party. So I believe that this is not covered in these current reforms that are proposed by uh, Vali Musa and his committee. So I would say that that should be considered as we go forward. But at the heart of the problem is the role of the citizen, the taxpayer, the person who pays the salaries of all these politicians. If the citizen is not empowered to control who goes into office, if 
who is paid the salary by his taxes, then these electoral reforms are, are far low, are far inadequate in my mind, and not meeting the interest, and they won't prevent state capture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, same table, anyway. Then we'll come to this side. I see you. I see you. Uh, Jim Powell, Direct Democracy. Uh, the proposal is that we do have, in all three levels of government, a mixture of ward and proportional representation, but a slight difference. First of all, any votes for the ward should not be transferred for the party over to proportional representation. Uh, the other thing is, let's take um, a party A. They get 50% uh, of the wards but they get 40% of the proportional representation. They would not get any proportional representation. If we take uh, party B, they get 20% of the wards and 30% of the proportional representation, they would then get 10%. And another party, no wards, but 5% of the proportional representation. That would overall uh, give uh, a, a representation of all small factions as well. And the last point I'd like to make is that unless we have a contract of accountability before the elections, they'll go back in their own rules and ignore us. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, let me see some hands. I've got one hand. Do I have other hands this side of the room? Uh, of people who want to make a contribution on if you agree with the majority view with slight variation and what is that slight variation? You go, my brother. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Morris Hoda from Break the Chain Movement. I think I agree with option three with some few amendments. Uh, I think this is the most important meeting that I've attended now recently. Um, I think Lawson highlighted one important factor that should be driving this process further. He mentioned, and which is correct and which is true, that all political parties have failed us as citizens because they have proven we don't need new statistics. We don't need new researches. It's out there. They are there for themselves. What worries me about this electoral amendment, are we allowing ourselves to be co-opted into the very same system that is oppressing the citizen? Because the citizen are the most important people before political parties. Where I am sitting or standing, for me and the people that I speak to, the constitutional amendment that Dr. Mbete is avoiding, it is the way forward. We've had the first republic in this country. Since 1994, we had the second republic. So what this house is supposed to be looking at, has this worked for the past 28 years? If it's not working, why are we going short measures? I do accept and understand if for the time being we say, what is that that we can do for now? But we need that social compact where the citizens, social movements, and political parties sit together to say, this cannot go on. Because for me, it cannot be that we are sitting here, as a matter of fact, is working for political parties. I wish that there could be something that can be added in whatever document can come out of this, so that even including the elections should be streamlined. All elections should happen at the same time. Because this whole thing, where after every two years, this country is on election mode, no wonder this country is going down the drains because it's a career to political parties. I mean, they're just there for elections and nothing else. That's why 
what is happening in Joburg, what has just happened right now, it's what is going to happen in PE, it's what is going to happen in Nizna. The, the issues of collusions might be working for other countries, well-established countries, but for this new democracy, then the Third Republic should be looking at what is that that can really work in the meantime right now as we are having this political system. But in, working, in moving forward, what is that that can make sure that all hands are on the deck for this country? Because if we are going to be watching, looking at political parties, believe you me, I, I, I'm really scared and I'm scared for our people because most of the people that we listen to, people who are out there, most of our people are saying that if then black people are failing to govern this country, then we rather allow white people to govern. That is the discussion that is happening because our people seem not to be understanding this very same political act where they vote, then all of a sudden their power is no longer there because the political parties are doing as they please with it. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your hand is also up. Okay. Noted. Noted. Uh, <laughs> come here, Tessa, at the front, please. And then I'll give uh, Advocate Gumbi a chance. My name is uh, Reverend Tsepo Matuba Tuba from the Anglican Diocese of Johannesburg. I think I support the majority uh, 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 proposal with the rider that yeah. I don't think the independents are not representing anybody because you'll find that that independent, there's a civil society that is behind that person, maybe like a ratepayers, residents association who are tired of net getting service because they have just uh, voted for somebody they don't know. But this person, I think accountability will be more on that person because he doesn't owe allegiance to a political party which can decide to remove uh, that person if the person is not towing the line of the political party at the expense of the residents or the people that the person is supposed to be uh, 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 representing. So I think more and more, even churches maybe, may actually uh, uh, participate and encourage people to go and vote because it is difficult now to encourage people to say, go and vote when they know that they have got no sort of accountability over that person. But if we say, now this is your person, if they don't deliver, you are going to be directly actually uh, communicating with that person and you can remove that person in the next uh, part of elections. So I think it's a good, really, uh, 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 proposal that independence, even though uh, Dr. was saying, in our electoral system, they seem not to be uh, accommodating uh, the mixing of political representation and independence. But I think it makes sense to me, because you're directly responsible to the people that have put there, and you are going to work for them, and not for the people that you don't know. Thank you so much. I am, mm -mm -mm, um, I am going to take that hand because a lot of men have been speaking. Um, there's a hand on the yeah, table in front of you, Kaliwe. I want, I want us to move to table discussions soon, but uh, after Advocate Kumbi speaks. Okay. I greet you all. Hello. Okay, my name is Balisa Mpatlele. I'm from Hydrocycle and I also represent Class NOP uh, that deals with law students. And the reason I'm here today is to just uh, learn a few things about law and also to send my inputs. Because I believe that we as voters, we only matter when we have to cast the vote to a certain party. And after they receive the seats, they forget about us. Uh, what I suggest is that there should be a way where we could enforce certain policies that will hold each party accountable 
I mean, we've seen with um, our state capture on issues of corruption, uh, the process take long to get uh, whoever is involved in cases of corruption to account. So I believe that we should really reinforce strict measures where we get reports on each party's performance and if a party is found with majority of corrupt leaders like we've seen from the likes of the ANC there should be a way that uh, such a party should be removed I, I don't know how the policies work but there should be a way that a party it's corrupt beyond explanation should be removed because people are suffering these the spending state resources the proceedings they take long and yet nobody is booked so that's my plea thank you thank you Palesa. Uh, i actually like your plan i think there is something in law that has not been explored to prove that a party is deploying irresponsibly to the harm of the state and that it might need to be deprived. Yes, <laughs> My hand was up. My hand was up. You asked who wants to, to make uh, proposals on, the, on option two. I think first of all, just as an overall chair, to say in the afternoon we are going to discuss short-term, medium-term, and, and long-term interventions. So we are trying, this morning we are trying to hone in on what needs to be done before December. And, uh, but in the afternoon we'll look at the long-term ones. So I, I support your majority report, Stay. I'm also just very sad that it looks like the split uh, the, the minority report was written by people who, who put on an administrative head. You know, it's, it's people who have administered elections and they were like, oh my God, this is going to be too difficult. And as a result, then wrote a, a minority without, as I said in my introduction, looking at the, the real fundamental rights approach. But I... I think that when we think about what is it that we are trying to correct, when you look at your, your, your report, you are suggesting a 50-50. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to say to someone earlier spoke about doing away with proportionality. Unfortunately, in the short term, we can't because the Constitution says you must have a system that results in some proportionality. So that 50-50 split for me is a little problematic considering what it is that we are trying to correct. And if we are trying to correct and, and, and rein in this political party misbehavior, then you are unlikely to get that with a 50-50, you know, 200, 200 members of parliament because, I mean, political parties are notorious for trying to go for these individuals. And if they get just one person to vote with them of the independents, that's it. <laughs> you know, they carry the National Assembly. And so I think that we need more of the individuals, they, of course they come with their own prejudices and all of that, but I think when we look at what it is that we are trying to correct, we should have more of the, of the people who run as independents or individuals or in association with loose association than the, the political parties. Uh, that's, for me, that's, that's very important in the short term to make sure that we really don't have what we have now. It's, uh, I don't want to go into it, but just listening to the Enyo Beni reports and results of just children dying, you know, you're just like, what kind of society 
are we, are we building up? So that, that's my only proposal. I like, I support it, Lukona, but change the numbers. Uh, thank you, Advocate Kumbi. Uh, I think still we are, we're not reopening the MAC, don't worry. We're just taking it forward a little. I'm going to ask uh, Tessa to help us with the questions that we are going to use for the table discussions. I'm going to bully uh, that table with Prof. Seth Cooper. Um, and Ibrahim to join one of the round tables. So all the square tables at the back, there are some, oh, and Sean, I'm also going to bully your table. <laughs> and the one next to you, uh, there are spaces in some of the round tables uh, to join in on the conversation. And that will be 15 minutes uh, for the table conversations. And then we'll do some feedback uh, before the IEC's Chief Electoral Commissioner. Tessa. No shame, at least I, you know, I can speak. Uh, abilities other than mics. Um, good morning, everyone. So in the group discussion, we want to hone in on three questions. And really the group discussion is for us to crystallize um, and put on paper some of our views and some of our thoughts. We won't be able to share everything um, that we come up with in the plenary session, but we think it's a good idea to be able to put on paper and that we collate um, all of that information. So you'll see on your tables, there are yellow and um, orange uh, cardboards. Please use that in a marker pen um, or a pen, whatever works just to write down um, the things that come up for the three questions we're going to give you. And also have a rapporteur ready to be able to feed back on some of the questions. So the three questions we have, um, the first one is for the group to come up with the top three features that you think a electoral system that is ideal for us should have. So what are the top three features of an ideal electoral system? And this is also to consider that Yes, we, we are talking about the bill that's on the table now as part of the conversation. But let's also assume that we can invent and think beyond just what's on the table at the moment. So this can be very practical things that you think need to be part of the electoral system or some of the outcomes that you think the electoral system needs to be able to produce. So we just want you to think of three features that you agree on at the table should be part of an ideal electoral system. So that's question one. Is everyone clear on that? Yes? All right. The second one is for us to talk a bit about constituencies. So the question is for us to talk about what an effective constituency could look like. So some people have given ideas about that in the room already. So in terms of the size, the geography it should cover, um, the numbers um, in parliament, let's put down some ideas in the group that we can agree on in terms of what we think an effective constituency might look like um, at a national level and the provincial levels. Yeah? <laughs> the th um, um, issue that came up in the room. Um, the question is about accountability and a recall clause. So how should accountability be factored into the system? What can be put into the electoral system that allows people, either as individuals or parties, to be able to be removed if they are not um, operating effectively. So what could a re-clause, recall clause possibly look like? And if there's any other measures around accountability that the, that the group comes up with, that would be great. So we're going to ask for us to talk about this for about 15 minutes um, and note down any suggestions onto the yellow papers or the orange papers on your table. Um, and then have a, a repertoire ready to feedback. Thanks.
All right, we have about three minutes left. Um, if you don't cover all of the questions, that's fine. Um, so get as far as you can.
uh, colleagues, we are going to feedback in a minute. Right, everyone, I'm going to ask everyone to please take their seats. Um, tell you where. Um, I'm looking for tell you where. Are we ready to feedback? Hi, everyone. This thing is so loud. All right, I'm going to ask that from each table. Hi, everyone. Sanborn. Let's please settle down. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to ask from each table, can we have a representative just raise their hand? And let's get the feedback started. So we'll start Luando. Colleagues, colleagues, colleagues. Colleagues, 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 colleagues. I know the I know the debates. This table is clearly not done. And that table. Little Honolo, please control your table. I'm I'm going to have to now ask people to control their tables. Colleagues can <laughs> colleagues. All right. The Clap once if you can hear my voice. I'm trying to control the table there. Clap <laughs> once if you can hear my voice. All right, we're together now. So can I have a group that just raises their hand? You have one minute just to share with us some of the things that came from your group. All right. All right. Lukwana, do you have a group yet? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Nkulula Kotsilani. So what we looked at was the first, two, the first question and the last question. So the first one dealing with the top three features of a, an electoral system. Um, the ones we settled on were transparency, simplicity, and uh, broad-based uh, participation. I'm just going to focus on the last one because that's one that hasn't really been discussed. So I think in one thing that we found that wasn't really discussed in these electoral reforms is, is participation. In certain countries, we know that uh, participation in elections is mandatory. Um, otherwise, it comes with certain penalties and, set, and fines and, and the like. So we thought that would be a, an important consideration of an, of an electoral system because without broad-based participation, it essentially loses the value of, of, of uh, democracy and, and people having their voice. Um, on the last uh, question, we didn't deal with the second one, we dealt with the last one. Um, we, we agreed that there should be some form of recall clause. Um, we, did not find, we, 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 we couldn't really find consensus on, on how that should look in the short term, but we, we do believe that there should be some sort of regular reporting mechanisms and constituency engagement. Um, one thing that we also found where we, we, we weren't too sure if we were moving backwards or not is that we, 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 the question as to whether what we're trying to do in terms of removing political parties is necessarily the, the right approach um, on the basis that when you vote for a political party, you are essentially um, co-signing their, their philosophy, their track record, and all of that. And if a political party has that direct accountability mechanism can then say, look, we were voted for X, Y, and Z, and you're not fulfilling that mandate, that's a very quick accountability mechanism as opposed to having to wait for um, if we have a, a, a recall every, every half term or, or so. So 
uh, we, we kind of, well, we, yeah, as a table, kind of argue that um, political parties are a form of accountability. And if you're not happy with the form of accountability that a, politi that a particular political party is, is taking, then you can obviously then um, change okay. your vote. Yeah, thank Got you. Got you. So I'm going to ask everybody to limit your feedback to one minute. Um, so we have another table. It's ready. Behind you, Lukona. And if something's been covered, just cover other things um, as we go. Okay. Um, well, we said putting citizens at its core. I'll just cover the things that have not been covered. Um, that it must be based on appropriate civic education, which is much more than voter education. And um, it, have, it must have minimum requirements that excludes from public office demagogues and populists, um, people who preach violence and stuff like that. And uh, an, effect, an effective constituency must, have, um, must use municipal uh, constituencies and it must ensure diversity and representation by careful uh, demarcation. And we must move deliberately towards building one human um, South African um, nationhood. Regarding accountability and recall, I think they've covered us. All right, next Thank table, you. please raise your hand. Here we go. There's three items. The first one is a recall of political representative system by the voters rather than the political party. The second one is a citizen direct election of the president, the premier, and the mayor. And the second one, uh, and the third one on any item is it's a citizen initiated referendum and that would be within the, the council, the province, and South Africa. Thank you. Those are very, very good um, interventions. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so our group, we were actually quite conflicted, but we felt that constituencies are an important part of a feature of a system and there should be some kind of incentive on political education in order for us to get buy-in. And there needs to be some form of direct linkages and direct representation. Um, and those representatives should be accountable to the public. So they should be first accountable to their constituency and then the party thereafter. We support the majority judgment, but a big part of our discussion was that we need to do away with the provinces, Currently, the provinces more, have more power than um, local government. And then in terms of uh, recall clause, we felt that we perhaps need to follow uh, the American system where people are in power for four years but can be re-elected again. And then one of the challenges that we had with the recall clause was who actually gets to decide who's recalled, when and how. Um, and using which method. So that's something we didn't get to discuss in detail. Thank you. Great. I like that people are adding on suggestions. So if things in your group are covered, then you're just adding on. Uh, we have a team on the side there. Hi, everyone. I'm going to ask us just to focus in. Um, so we only tackled two questions. So for the first question, the first point was that youth participation should be stronger in the electoral reform. And the second point is that um, there has to be strong accountability and proper representative of the people and that fundamental issues of the youth should be addressed at all times and not when it is time for elections. Um, and that the electoral, the electoral system should not be tribalized. And then the second question, for the second question, it was the constituency must be representative of the country and the general demographics of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another group who's ready? Lukona? Oh, thank you. Uh, our group uh, limited ourselves into a majority uh, report. We think that. Uh, uh, this mixed member system which we support should have clear nomination rules. For example, how do we determine the candidate and so forth. 
Secondly, the electoral process, which uh, we support that all political parties and including independent candidates should have primary elections. So basically to avoid this corrupt a system of uh, leaders imposing candidates. Then we also deal with uh, the, effect the effectiveness of constituencies. Uh, we highly agree that 50-50 uh, split between single member seats and multi-member, uh, one national multi-member, it's, 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 it's correct. But we are saying that the PR system or the PR list should also have some quotas, 25% uh, youth, 50-50 gender, and maybe also put academic credentials to say at least uh, let's have 50% uh, who have degrees because, you know, in parliament we have uh, committees like Standing Committee on Finance. So those, those type of institutions within parliament, uh, uh, they require also uh, academic knowledge. The issue of accountability, we didn't get into it, but uh, we support the recall clause and also want to put input uh, into a, a suggestion that uh, we should establish an independent com commission on public representative so that they can facilitate that uh, recall clause. Thank you. Some very detailed um, recommendations. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you. So, we delved a bit on accountability. And for one, if the bill suggests that we vote directly for an individual, then the individual should be like held accountable, right? So um, MPs do not act on their own accord. So if we can now, if the MPs who are corrupt are held accountable for their actions, that's going to change the way the whole party operates and the surrounding parties, how they now deal with stuff because the population now can directly tell them that you've been doing so and so, we do not want it, please step down. Then in terms of the recall, um, if you are given a five year term, then in between those five years, we can have a re elections, midterm elections in the party. If you're not doing, um, the, your, your, your party can have the power to say, to recall you if you're not doing something that you're supposed to do, then the party can have an elections and you can be stepped down and somebody else can now step up. All so, right. yeah, that is it. Thank you. Great. That covers quite a bit. Kaliwe at the back. So, hi, everyone. Um, so, for question one, we believe that in government there's a work culture issue. So, there's three features that we want to introduce, accountability, transparency, and inclusivity. And so, we'll start with inclusivity. Um, it should be part of the work culture to um, bring psychological safety into the team because when people can bring their full selves to work, they better reflect the people. Number two, transparency. We believe that there should be brutal transparency as part of the work culture in government. And so they should, um, the government should communicate to the constituents directly and have street meetings directly and report back on what is going on so then the, so then commit, uh, the constituents can hold them accountable directly and um, ask them questions on what's going on directly. And lastly, accountability. Um, we believe that um, it, it, to respond to question three, to link back to question three, there should be a strict reporting culture where um, KPIs and there's, uh, are, are strictly adhered adhere to. And um, when KPIs are not adhered to, then there's consequences which they can be removed. And there should also be part of accountability. There should also be a reporting structure where the government uh, should report to the constituents directly, whether it's share their process through social media or, um, or through the media um, consistently on what's going on and how are they working towards this issue consistently. Thank you. I'm going to ask people to please not have conversations. The acoustics in this room mean every, any, every voice is amplified. So it makes it a bit difficult for us. Uh, good day, everyone. On the ideal electrical reform that on our group we spoke of, in almost every election that we have, we speak of free and fair elections. And you find that in most cases, it's either borrowed papers are being thrown away or they don't arrive at the counting station. 
So we discuss about on our ideal, ideal electrical reform. It is that it's in about time we have we digitize our elections in a sense of having them on an electronic basis. And on the accountability part, we need to have um, appoint neutral people who are also working on the elections, those who are not affiliated to any union or anything which is... Oh, is there? Sorry. Go. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, in our group, just to reiterate, we want the centrality of the parliamentary constituency office to sort of come through and also equal sort of candidate um, uh, funding, if you will, that will be managed uh, by the IEC. So that constituency office will manage the, thre the thresholds for recall, the thresholds for political party candidate financing, and the thresholds for the constituency itself. Thanks. Really, really important part of our system, yeah? Good. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Luando. It's Luando Fanana. So we, 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 we named our group as It Can Be Done, and we are doing it now. That's the name of the group. My, our, the, first, uh, okay, the first question, we, we said that each an electoral system should include inclusivity. That is... The demarcation must be structured in the way that the poor areas are included with the super rich areas so that the resources can be distributed uh, equally to people who are not in the same state of, 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 of living, right? And then the second one is simplicity. Simplicity uh, is on, it's on language. The language you use as you are dealing with the system that you want people to understand. And also the structures that you're going to use must be very simple in the way that anyone, even the, the kids can understand that if we are going to a community hall, what should we expect out of that community hall? And then the second one, which is the constituency, we are rigorously saying that let's step out the provinces. We see provinces as a waste of resources, time, and, 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 uh, and our energy, right? So if you step out the, the provinces, you're going to have national government uh, that is made out of people who, are in the pro who were in the province, the upper people in the province to join the national government and those who are in the lower parts of the provinces to be assisting the local government. Yes, and then, what's the last one? And the last one, accountability. Accountability is, is a bit tricky because, which I write it? Okay, so we are saying for us to, 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 to actually achieve accountability, we must have people who now and again are reporting to their constituencies, probably three times a term. Yeah. So what you are reporting on is the challenges that you get as the representative the, uh, the opportunities that you get as the representative, and also your own solutions on, on both of them. Thank you. Great. Where's the next mic? There we go. Oh, so uh, then we'll bring the mic there. Yeah. Okay. Your mic is off. questions came down with three uh, basic principles. Um, we want uh, direct accountability for every representative, every MP and so on, uh, must be accountable to voters. Um, the second issue, uh, as far as constituencies go, we want, we, 
discuss the, the size of constituencies. The smaller the constituency, the better representation there will be, the more accountability there will be. So we're recommending 200 constituencies, uh, assuming that the uh, parliament remains with 400 MPs as a total. And then the last issue of the recall vote, we support it, but it has to be properly structured. We have to take in issues of uh, violations of ethics, transparency, and ensure that the system cannot be abused because if we have a willy-nilly one, it can easily be abused. Thank you. Next table. Good morning, everybody. Um, the first one, the first question is that, um, which is our ideal electoral system? There's three aspects. Firstly, we believe in you must vote for an individual. Doesn't mean only an independent candidate, but it must be an openless system because that enhances transparency and accountability. Secondly, it must be from that community. And thirdly, um, diversity is very uh, important, which would include um, the gender issue, which we believe should be 50%. Regarding constituencies, we definitely believe in what Advocate Gumbi said about um, a majority must come from the constituencies. So a 300-100 split is more important, because we believe that's important. But there must be an uh, equitable allocation. Say now there's um, 25 million people that are registered as voters. Divide the 400 or the 200, whatever the allocation is, um, so that there's equitable allocation by all of that. And there must be no gerrymandering of any form of boundaries. Um, accountability, obviously, is important to us. We do believe in a midterm um, type of uh, recall mechanism. Political parties are already doing it midterm to check their um, the parliamentarians, but we believe there must become certain professional organizations that to become a member of parliament, there's a professional organization that can be accountable like the Independent Candidates Association. Thank Great. you. Look on you have a table there. Yeah. Uh, salutation to the house at large. Um, the first question was uh, uh, about top The first question was about the three features of an ideal electronic, uh, electoral system. We came up with these answers. A system that prioritizes voter education and civic education. The second one must have a deliberate accountability program and effective oversight committees. With regards to the MP clause, we strongly believe that there should be a, set, a certain manner or a, clo a clause which will ensure that MPs are recalled when they do not adhere to the promises that they have made to the people of South Africa and to the general public. And to ensure that corruption, mismanagement of public funds, these M MPs should adhere to the principles that are entrenched in the Constitution. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've rounded up all the tables. And uh, thank you very much. I, I think it's important to have the views of, of uh, everyone and not just the organizers of the conference. So that was great. I think we've collected, Lukona has collected all of them and they are going to be part of the discussions as we move forward. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask us to be just a little patient. This issue is, is quite important, as I said. It's, a, it's as important as the right to life. So I, I think we, we can spend a little more time on it. I'm sure that we can even eat into our lunch time um, in discussing this very important issue. I, our next speaker is uh, the Chief Electoral Officer of the IEC, but fortunately he's come with his bosses. So I'm going to ask all of them to come up. Uh, Commissioner Janet Love is here, Commissioner Musutu Muyapa. You must come and sit with your CEO up here. <laughs> so that you take responsibility for whatever he says. And, uh, and uh, well, 
thank you so much for, for coming along. Uh, um, this, uh, this morning, no, yeah, come and, come and sit here. I think um, now that you are all here, and uh, the, the old, the real old, old boss is also here, Sislo <laughs> Pebam. So we can, we can take some time once Sai has finished his presentation. If there's a, a few questions or clarification from the floor, while we have the, the commission here with us today, I think I can use my chair's uh, prerogative to allow people to ask a few questions of the IEC if clarification is needed. But uh, we've, uh, yeah, Musutu and uh, Janet and Sai, this morning we spoke about an approach to this matter that recognizes the fundamental nature of the right to vote and be voted in, uh, rather than focus on the administrative difficulties. And so we want you to wear that hat as well, <laughs> that says this is a right that people gave their lives for. And, and accountability is a key thing. Um, I said in my opening remarks that these members of parliament can reintroduce the death penalty, you know, if they get a two-thirds majority. So the constitution means nothing if you don't give it to responsible people. And so that's the approach that this group is taking to this issue. It's not a formalistic approach. It's more of a fundamental right approach. And we hope that uh, you will use the same approach in your input. So, Sai, over to you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director Mujanku. Uh, I'm accompanied by the Vice Chairperson of the Commission, uh, Ms. Janet Love, as well as uh, Musotu Mebja. I think given the intellectual firepower that is on the ground, I needed some support uh, from commissioners. Um, I was not going to be sufficient on my own. But thank you very much, and thanks for, um, for the invite. Now, I think at the outset, the Commission has taken the position that the choice of electoral system it's a matter of national policy where parliament must express itself. Of course, it does not mean that the commission is agnostic about that choice. It is not because we've got to ensure that the mechanics of an election work. So whatever choice, a policy choice is made, must be workable ultimately. And that's the entry point of the commission into the whole policy discussion. The second point that I think it has to be made clear up front is that the, the national choices that are before the country have implication for the quality of an election that can be delivered. And I'm going to talk a lot about that this afternoon. Now, the right to vote becomes hollow if the mechanical arrangements that are made to deliver that election are defective. So, if we make choices that result in the inability of an elections administrator to make proper 
mechanical arrangements for an election, the very right to vote, the constitutional right to vote becomes hollow. So I think um, it is important that we, we establish that nexus between the mechanical arrangements of election on the one hand and the right to vote. They bear an important causal relationship. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very, very crucial point. So can we go to the next slide, which, which is the, uh, the outline of the presentation? So I'm going to deal with the, with the timelines. I'm going to deal with the implications for business applications. I'm going to deal with ballot paper applications, implications, sorry. I'm going to deal with election deposits. And lastly, vote public and voter, uh, voter education. We all know that the last national and provincial election was held on 8 May 2019. And the outer date on which the 2024 election may be held is 5th August 2024. The earliest date will be the 8th um, May 2024. So that's the constitutionally permissible timeline in which the 2024 elections could be held. The Commission is looking at the possibility of two registration weekends to maximize opportunity for people to register and to maximize opportunity for voters to amend their details um, on the voters' roll. Of course, the Commission has increased the modalities of registration. We have introduced an online registration portal, which all of us can use at our leisure. There are safeguards that have been built into that portal, but it is an option that is available even today. That portal is intended in particular to increase the level of registration of young persons. And indeed, ahead of 2021 election, 540,000 people use that to register themselves. Now, that electronic intervention does not displace the necessity for the two registration weekends because the registration weekends is an equalizer of registration opportunity. You go to a voting station, it takes you five or ten minutes, it's the same for everybody throughout the country. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a modality of registration that remains pertinent because of its ability to, look, to equalize access to the electoral process. Now, here's an important point. Um, the commission requires a minimum of 18 months minimum of 18 months to prepare for election on a finalized electoral system. Not a probable uh, electoral system, not, not one subject to uh, parliamentary process still. It has to be decided 18 months before for the mechanical arrangements of an election um, to be made. Now, 
some, some of you here are political commentators and so on, and the message that we are hearing from you is that 2024 is likely to be a watershed election. And if it's so, it therefore means the, the preparation and the administration of that election must be well done. So that whoever emerges victorious, they can claim their victory without the loser saying, I've lost because of the poor management of the electoral process. It has to be a well-managed election. But in order to have a well-managed election, you need certainty on the electoral system at least 18 months before. It's no matter of, lux of administrative luxury for the Electoral Commission. It's no matter of electoral, um, administrative convenience for the Electoral Commission, but it's, it's about an imperative to make proper arrangements in order to give meaning to the right to vote. Because without those proper arrangements, that right becomes empty. It becomes empty if, when you go to a voting station, there are no ballot papers in sufficient quantity. It becomes hollow if you go to a voting station and the presiding officer is not well trained on the new system. It becomes hollow when the IT applications that undergird the preparation have not been tested and audited, um, and so on. So, that is a very important point that uh, we really want to leave with yourselves. That choices can be made and it is not the station of the commission to make those choices for the country, but the commission must advise on the logistical and mechanical implication of the choices that have been made. And that once so made, to have a recognition that they have an implication on the timeline, which is what I'm going to deal with next. These are high-level um, probable timelines. No, they have no definitive um, um, position to them at the moment. We are looking at a possibility of two registration weekends, like I indicated, to maximize opportunity for access to the electoral process. One in November, possibly 2023, and the second in February 2024. Um, <clears throat> and then we contemplate a 93-day election timetable for reasons that I'll shortly outline. We've got to give people ample opportunity to raise objections on the voters' role so that the commission can investigate those objections and make a determination on those objections before the voters' role is certified. It is not helpful uh, after the election to come and say, but Sai ought to have registered in that voting district and not the other one, or, and, and vice versa. We've got to deal with all complaints and objections related to the voters' role after having published the voters' role and uh, investigate whatever difficulties there may be and, uh, and have them determined and then certify the voters' role. And once so certified, 
the voter's roll is the basis upon which an election rests. Next, uh, 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 we are at uh, business application implications. I forgot to tell you next. But I won't forget to count all ballots. Uh, no. <laughs> all right, thanks. Now, once the electoral system is settled and, and, and done, it means a new election result and seat allocation system must be developed. Because these things, you know, you need an underlying business application um, that is alive to the legal principles embedded in the law. So you must write this new application to suit the new scenario. Um, your election result system and your seat allocation system. And this new election result and seat allocation system must be audited to, to ensure that it does that which it's intended to do. And it must be availed to political parties and contestants, uh, including independents, to satisfy themselves that it is doing the right things. So, modest revisions of the current system will not suffice. A complete reconfiguration of the electoral system is required. A nine-month period for, of coding and development is necessary a testing and trial run of the new application is necessary, an external audit, and two extensive dry runs are required. Because it will be foolhardy to take a half-baked system into the field. It is going to compromise the quality of the election to take a half-baked electoral system into the field. Similarly, a new national provincial election candidate nomination system must be developed. This must take into account independent candidates. Um, it must take into account the possible capturing of supporting signatures, and so on. Again, you need uh, nine months for that. Of course, these nine months, eight months, they can run uh, parallel to each other. It doesn't mean you need nine months and then wait another nine months. Not, not that. Um, there, are, there are teams that can work um, um, concurrently. We also need to rewrite the ballot paper generation system. Now, let's talk next, let's talk the, uh, the ballot paper implications of, the, of any new system. <clears throat> Currently, in national and provincial elections, there are 10 ballot configurations, one national ballot and nine, nine provincial ballots. The current proposed system will increase the ballot configuration to 19, 19 different ballot per permutations. The proposed third ballot for regional elections will increase the number of ballots to be pr printed to over 70 million. Now, with increased uh, contestations, both parties and independent uh, candidates, the ballot sizes are going to increase. That one, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. That with the increase of contestants, the ballot uh, sizes 
are going to increase naturally. Now, Sislope is aware of a ballot that we printed uh, in the GRC in 2006. She couldn't believe her eyes when she saw an AO uh, uh, size, a star newspaper size ballot of several pages. Oh, was it six? With 692 candidates. Now, we may be going that way, <clears throat> but that, that, that is not a problem because it, must, it, it could be the, uh, the logical consequence of our human, human rights architecture, you know? So it may, it may just be a logical consequence of our human rights architecture. But here's a, a logistical issue. South African printing industry, the, or, or let, let's put it this way, the capacity of the South African, the capacity of the printing industry to print ballots of more than, of the length of more than 700, 720 millimeters is very limited. In fact, when we last checked, only three to, only about three printing concerns could produce this type, this size ballot within the time timelines uh, that we have to work with. Now, an undesirable option is possibly to consider printing some of the ballots outside of the country. And as an elect election administrator, we believe it's, it's, uh, it's, it's undesirable. You always want to have processes related to your, democ uh, to your democracy to be homegrown, you know. Um, so we're printing more ballots, 70 million of bigger sizes. With, a, with, a, with limited printing capacity because the printing presses are not geared for this type of printing. And the printing win window period is 14 days. From the date you certify the final list of candidates to election day, you probably have 14 days. So you must print this 70 million ballots within 14 days, but Again, printing is not a problem. The problem is packaging per station, per ward, and distributing to the right place. So there's a whole lot of logistical complexity inherent in the ballot production process. N and next. <laughs> now, the current version of the, of, the, of the bill authorizes the commission to prescribe election deposits. Those have, have obviously have not been finalized, uh, the election deposits. Um, the commission will, in due course, outline a process that will possibly in, have a, a, a public participation component uh, to it to determine the election deposit for national, provincial, for parties, and then um, national and um, provincial for e independent uh, candidates. Next slide. <clears throat> now, it stands to reason that a change of this magnitude requires massive public education. You know, it's not going to be <clears throat> voter education, no, you got two ballots and this is how you mark them type thing. This is a game change. So you've got to invest significant resources and time in public education. Again, partnerships uh, with uh, civil society um, can be considered. 
um, ongoing engagements with the youth in schools and institutions is currently taking place. And before we, we take leave of the podium, Commissioner Love just want to make one or two other additional points. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, and um, I think part of the reason for me wanting to, to speak before we open for engagement is just to emphasize, we came here when you were having an in, a, a really riveting discussion around issues to do with the type of elections that the country needs, in your view, in order to ensure that there's accountability accountability of those you elect, clarity about what their commitments are. You spoke about different options that you are in favor of. I think what Sai has tried to emphasize is those choices are the most important choices. They are the choices that are deeply political, but they are not the choices that an electoral management body can make on anybody's behalf. I think that's the first context that we're trying to, to put here. The second context is to say that when we are looking at an election process, for people who need to see the change, need to see a constitution that realizes its promise. The technical detail feels bureaucratic almost. It's like, how can we bear to listen? But we are saying to you, there are really practical consequences. Sai so spoke about the fact that the election of 2024 must happen between the 8th of May and the 5th of August. Ours is usually a preference not to leave it right to the end, because if there are things that need to be done, you don't want to have no time after the main election day to even be able to fulfill constitutional obligations. So let's say we're looking at May. What does that mean? The proclamation to accommodate this 93-day timetable is in February. What does that mean? By February, registration closes. That means you've got to have two election weekends before. We've got in the, in the middle of that, we've got the festive season. So what does that mean? We're talking about a process that really has got to be well on the way. Everybody understanding what is required no later than October. So when we try and put the practical implications, it's not to be as, you know, to, to take away from the key issues that you've been discussing, but it's to say we need that certainty. We desperately need certainty in a manner that gives us, as an election management body, time. Now, does that mean we in the IEC believe that all the issues that you have been talking about today, that have been out there in the discussions, that all of those issues, or even half of them, could be resolved in terms of the process that is supposed to deliver a final piece of legislation signed, ready to be implemented by the 10th of December? In all likelihood, not. Somebody, when we came in, was talking about having constituencies. Somebody mentioned something in the 60s, somebody, in the two, somebody said something in 200. If you're going to have constituencies, it's definitely not something that there's going to be time for us as an election management body to implement for 2024. What we are saying is not that because of that, switch off that conversation. Don't look at issues of constituencies. Don't look at issues of any other changes. What we are saying is, 
If you need to have further conversations, let's look at how that process that you are kickstarting here amongst yourselves, how that process must unfold, but in a way that does not undermine the certainty and the good management of 2024. The conversations must continue. The conversations, the changes, the process for change must continue. But as the electoral management body, we are saying, please, we cannot have a situation where we are thrown under the bus as a country, not as an election management body, because we have uncertainty about what system we need for 2024. Beyond 2024, there's no question that there could be many additional changes. And we're not suggesting that therefore the process of discussion stops now with whatever these changes to the legislation are. But we are saying, please, let us ensure that we do this in a way that the complexity that is going to come in 2024 is not compromised by uncertainty. I think that's the context. And I'm saying this because I'm scared of her, because she told us that we can't just look at this in terms of, you know, bureaucratic things. So I just wanted to just, you know, but really I just want to say we celebrate the fact that this conversation is happening we celebrate the fact that there's a sensitivity to understanding electoral systems. We are not wanting to come between that and those kinds of demands. All that we are asking for is the certainty for 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. Uh, uh, I, I trust this commission. And I know that when the, the new nation decision was handed down in June of 2020, they started working. Because I know, I know they, they know what that decision meant. So for the past two and a half years, they have done the basic work because they, they can read. They went to school, all of them, I can assure you. They read that decision and they knew exactly what it meant. Uh, rather than wait for, yes, I'm going to come to the floor, rather than wait for, for the parliamentarians. They are ahead of, of parliament. That's the kind of commission that we've built, and that's the kind of capacity that we've built. Musul, otherwise you'll disappoint me. <laughs> After working with you for so long, uh, I know you, those, those codings, and uh, everything has, uh, those have started already. Okay, just a few minutes of um, questions for clarifications. I have two there at the back and one here. Very quick, the food is here. <laughs> Great. Um, yes, thank you. Sir. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the members of the Commission for their feedback Can and their hear? inputs and their guidance around the practical challenges that we, or considerations that have to be made around what we offer. Um, I'm a little worried about the tenor of this request. Very practically, we have this, 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 this decision of national proportion, of national importance for the future of our country for, at the very least, the next 27 years, right? In terms of how we redesign the electoral system to serve us, because very clearly and very plainly, what we currently have is not serving us in the way that we need it to. We certainly agree that, or at least I certainly agree that, uh, we have to be thinking about the practical implications. However, those practical implications become restrictive to our capacity to imagine the future that we want and we deserve. I don't think that's very fair for us or the people of this country. The second thing is that 
It is up to the Commission, and it is up to Parliament, and it is up to the various institutions, including the Department of Home Affairs, of government to provide the necessary resourcing and capacity to enable whatever our imagination throws up at you as far as what we want and deserve. That's our decision to make. And I really feel that we should not be entreated in this way to limit our capacity to imagine because we are trying to think about the timetable. That rushes us. We have to be thinking very carefully and conscientiously about where it is that we want to arrive and what it is that will get us there. That is the task of this process. Thank you. Thank you. In front there. Uh, Jim Powell, Direct Democracy. Uh, first question I've got is, will the addresses be on the electoral list so we can check uh, to see if these um, are valid? Because we've had instances on by-elections in particular where people have been walking from... We can't one... hear you very well. Can't hear me. We can't hear you very well. Okay, sorry. Um, that will the addresses be included on the electoral roll so that we can check to see if they're in the right ward because we've had uh, situations on by-elections where people have been walking from one ward because they've been, for the by-election, uh, registered in the by-election ward. That's the first one. The second one is we say a deposit will not be returned if you don't win. Um, shouldn't that be if it's only a certain percentage? And the third one is, I don't believe that a deposit should be required uh, to take part as a candidate. Th that it should be the number of signatures, physical signatures that, that would be obtained and that would make it a very easy task for you to cut it off at 19 people. Thank you. I don't know if the commission was, uh, is already starting with public um, engagement on issues like the deposit, but this is not why we brought you here. We just brought you here to understand what's going on. Yes, sir. And then, Sean, you'll be the last one. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Nkulu Lako. Uh, I'm glad the commission is not agnostic on issues, so I hope you can give us some very robust uh, answers and, and views. Um, my first question, I think really when we're speaking about accountability of political parties and, and all of that, it's all leading towards the fact that voter participation is, is falling and is not where it wanted to be, more in particular um, from, the, from the youth section. So I, I want to know whether you think that there, uh, there's enough responsibility being given to the, to the IEC in terms of improving voter participation. And secondly, what your view would be on the, on the issue of um, compulsory voting, as we know multiple countries have that, as it's seen as a civic duty, not a, a luxury to, to be used as, as and when you, you see necessary. And then the second question that I want to ask is when we speak about the printing of ballots, because I think you, you covered really the, the practical implications and, and all, the, all the challenges that are going to happen there. Um, I want to know why we, we, we aren't having a conversation around electronic voting. Um, and I know it can't just be the, the ESCOM issue because for, for issues like that, we do know ESCOM can pause load shedding for a day or two. So I just want to know around the, the commission's view on electronic voting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I told you this commission is ready. I mean, they've already investigated the printing companies and they know them, you know, and they know what those ballot papers should look like. They've seen them before. Sean? No, th th thanks, Chair. I'm very happy that, as the previous speaker said, very happy that the commission is agnostic. But the commissioner loves input, seem to have veered in a particular direction that says it's, we must have a conversation about constituency options, but that it's not an option that must be on the table for 2024. We can't have a conversation about something that we might not have the power to do anything about if we lose that opportunity now. And the only reason we're having this conversation in the country 
is because there was a court judgment that forced parliament to deal with this issue. And the, the power that society has is to invoke that legislative right back to the courts if the outcome of this parliamentary process is unsatisfactory. So it, it can't be that there must just be a, a, a discussion. Uh, thanks, Chair. Okay. I want to say... So the, the first and the last uh, input, uh, I think, speak to the same issue, and I'm going to then ask um, Commissioner Moyepia to, to deal with a number of things as well as the CEO. But, Sean, thank you, because I think what you're putting is, is the counterweight to the question of the, the, the um, concern that was raised at the beginning about the notion that by raising practical implications and therefore constraints, we are doing something that feels fundamentally not fair. And you are putting that in the context of saying, this is an opportunity that can't be lost now. This is not something that the Electoral Commission is arguing against. And I'm putting it to you that we are not saying don't lose or lose the opportunity now, don't talk more. But bear in mind that legislation, particularly legislation that might even have a need for constitutional amendments, is going to be something that may not be able to be done by December. All we are saying to you is, as civil society, as stakeholders, you need, it's not us, you need to figure out how you can, on the one hand, insulate what the Constitution requires for regular elections, 2024, from what will become chaos if there's no clarity by, October, by December. So we are saying there are various ways that that can be done. There are ways in which you can engage with political parties to say, all right, maybe we don't get a full discussion by, and the court, of course, something that can go to the court. We don't get a full discussion. We don't, what did you say? We don't lose the opportunity now. We don't... Um, get short, short changed, if you like, in terms of being unfair. But we understand that for 2024, we might not get everything we want, but then we want another time frame for beyond. We're not saying you can't do that. What we are saying to you is think about that. I hope I've been clear. I'd like to say good afternoon to one and all. Um, you are beautiful people in this room. You've asked very difficult questions. They, they really do deserve good consideration and responses. I'm going to try. The issue about the tenor of the discussion um, we, we really don't intend to limit the discussion, but we do, we do wish that you robustly debate based on the realities we face. We, we had a reality of this nature last year. When we were preparing for an election on the one hand, under conditions we could not have foreseen and, and proceeded to prepare for an election but sought certainty in the court, the constitutional court. And you all know what the court said. The court said to us, free and fair elections are important, 
but regularity of those elections is it's more important. The court said you must hold them within the time frame. That's really what we are saying. We are saying we do, we do anticipate that that position is a position we face and we need to work within that reality. That's why we work backwards. We say what's the earliest opportunity to have an election and what would be the outermost opportunity for that election to take place. So it really is that reality that we talk about. And we have that constitutional responsibility to ensure that those elections are in keeping or consistent with the prescriptions of the Constitution. The issues relating, and I'll come back to the registration and by-elections because they were not very audible, but the issues relating to voter participation falling, it's a reality and a concern we have, uh, Ratila. We, we face that situation. But we can speculate on a number of issues. Uh, truth of the matter is the appointers, not exact science that says this is the reason. But let's be simplistic and say if the contestants in an election really interest people and the options are interesting, people tend to go out and contest and vote. When they are unhappy or they pick up dissatisfaction, um, they, in fact, indicate that by, amongst others, staying home. In terms of our own constitution, um, voting in this nation is not compulsory. In Australia it is, um, but here it is not. And, and, and that really is an issue we need to... So, essentially, we are saying we, 2024 may, in fact, raise that interest, and we have to prepare for that interest. But in, you know, what has happened in the past suggests that we, we have a lot of work to do as the commission, yourselves as civil society, but most importantly, candidates creating an opportunity for people to be excited and say, these are the choices we want to make. The issue about constituencies before or post-2024, Commissioner Love has touched on that, but here's a very real situation. The Municipal Demarcation Board has been created or established to deal with constituencies only in relation to municipal boundaries. Um, we are now talking sub-provincial boundaries. There is not even an institution established in law to do it. If sub-provincial constituencies must be heard for 2024, that body must be established, it must then undertake that work. We're not raising this matter for the first time. In fact, shortly after the Constitutional Court ruling in 2020, we put a paper together and said there are two options we see on the table. One has sub-provincial constituencies, another is inserts. And we were not making a decision. We were, we were simply saying to the extent that sub-provincial constituencies must be done, this would be an indicative thing that, that would have to be done with dates. We went to the Portfolio Committee in Parliament, and very recently, when an application was made to the Constitutional Court by Parliament, we went back and made a submission consistent with the submissions we have previously made and indicated where our challenges would lie. So we, that's really where we are at. We don't wish to stifle the, the, the discussion. We believe it's very important 
there are very uh, difficult and important issues that you need to have or deal with. And, 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 and so we will, as the Commission, um, deal with those issues um, to the extent that they are before us and, and you know, um, we have the opportunity to do so. In respect of the questions relating to by-elections and voter registration, can I, can I spend time and deal with them because we really couldn't pick them up and I tried to, um, to see, you know, to understand what they were. But I, I offer to spend time and answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, that is uh, electronic voting is in our radar. We've done a cross-national uh, research to see what other jurisdictions have done. And we are now engaging with Committee on Home Affairs on, that, um, on the results of that cross-national study. We are, however, desirous of an enabling provision in the law so that we can do pilots, at least during by-elections, so that we can see it, how does it work in a rural setting and how does it perform in an urban setting so that the insights we draw from those pilots can be brought to bear on a policy discussion that must unfold on the matter. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to the IEC. I, I, would, uh, I would be chased away, Janet, if I didn't give the last word. So I won't say anything. <laughs> I wouldn't give the last word to the IEC chairperson emeritus. She had her hand up. Sislope, uh, look on her. Give Sislope a mic. <laughs> she wants to say something very quickly. Yeah. A, a, a living ancestor. And so you don't have to be too upset about what the ancestors say. But I do want to tell my wonderful colleagues whom I love so much that you stand a big risk. That there are a number of people, Mnage, I'm too old, let's not talk about me. But there are too many of us in the country both young and old, in as much as we understand the difficult procedures, that you run a risk that because of the reputation you have as electoral commission and because of your amazing performance of the short time you were able to meet and also your other uh, well-known reputation of things that in the past you have done within a very, very short time. You have to understand that it's that reputation, which is a wonderful reputation, that South Africa still today enjoys a reputation of doing mapping of this country in six months. We really believe that the IEC, and I'm part of that group, though I'm, I'm, I'm on your side, you know that I'm on your side. <laughs> that if you lost the case, which might happen, people like my colleagues, all of you, we lost the case on overseas people, and surely you did overseas people. We lost a case on prisoners in this country, and surely we did a performance. And last year, you were at your best, at your best. So you ran a very big risk because of the good reputation and the real confidence, by the way, that many people in this country have. So be prepared for the worst, because there are many of us who are afraid that, you know, we'll be dead. So the sooner we can fight now and change this problem. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. We don't need to say anything after that. Uh, they've heard you, and they, they will rise to the occasion. I, I know them, and I trust them. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, unfortunately, your lunch hour went from one hour to 45 minutes to 30 minutes. Now I'm giving you 20 minutes for lunch. That's just the dictator that I am. The lunch is at the back there. 
You go, we are going to eat quickly. Wait, 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 Faisal. You can't be the irresponsible one. Sit down. So straight after lunch, you can't be the convener and be irresponsible. Straight after lunch, we go to our, to our breakaway sessions. You each have a folder. Somebody took mine. The folder has a distinct color. So the four breakaway rooms, two are on this floor. You go to your left as you come out and left again down that corridor. They will have the color of your folder there. And two are upstairs. Straight into the breakaway rooms, we write on time at half past three because uh, Nishan has to do something, Shan, and then Ntate uh, Vali Musa is going to address us. So we have to come back into this room. So quick lunch. You can skip it if you want to reduce weight like me. Then go to the sessions and then come back. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the IEC. <laughs> I do have to lose weight. <laughs>
background. Can I also ask you to come and occupy the seats here in front? Right, can we can we can we get started now? Can I ask the four people who are going to be reporting from their their groups if they could please come to, to the front here and take their seats? The four rapporteurs. Four people who are reporting back from their commissions, please come forward. Okay. Nobody reporting back. Dudu Telani, can we find out who are these rapporteurs? Right, we've got one, three more. How did it go in your group? How did it go in your group? Right, we're waiting for two more rapporteurs here. <laughs> Nobody wants to speak. <laughs> I'm still waiting for two commissions here to send us their representatives. Who's reporting back? One more. The last one. Who's the last person? I'm missing I'm missing one group. I see hands there, but I don't know what that means. Can we send Oh, okay. Right, we're waiting for the last few to finish at the tea table. Right, uh, people, let, let us start. Um, this session is about getting your feedback from these commissions. And I'm hoping that you've generated a set of ideas 
that are action oriented uh, that we can collectively here consider as part of a program of action to bring about electoral change in, 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 in South Africa and uh, who wants to go first? You'll go. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I won't be, be that long because our session was quite um, more of an education session. Um, so, for us, we, we were breakaway group number three. So for us, we came to consensus that we would support the majority view um, from the MAC albeit that there are some minor changes which would be very easy to, to change because we feel that the majority view is quite easy to implement. Um, so we would support, you know, going forward with that. However, um, in addition to that, there's the private members uh, bill which was pushed by, I think it was Monsieur Lakota, uh, which speaks to everything that we would really want um, for electoral reform. So we would push the majority view, but also as a side, in addition, push to reintroduce the private members uh, bill uh, that was squashed by parliament. Also because the private members bill would not really um, need the demarcation board and all of that, so it would be a, a much more easier process. Um, and then for a campaign idea, what we were thinking of, since we've got this two weeks, uh, where we have public comment from Parliament, we thought that it would be fruitful if we draft a report of some sort. Uh, we will, from this room, we will convene like a task team, draw up a report, and then add hundreds of signatures by civil society organizations and submit that uh, to Parliament just to kind of shake things up a bit at Parliament before the 16th of September. So that is what we... Um, um, came up with an outbreak away session. Right, two very clear things there. Uh, support for the Mac majority report with some amendments, and then to utilize the current opening for, 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 for submissions around substantive changes uh, and lobbying wider support for that and, and submitting that to parliament. Okay, can I get from my left, one of you? This works. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was in, or we were in break away room four, uh, where we spent most of the time thinking about how we can mobilize um, the public, uh, the broader public, especially young people, uh, behind, uh, to get behind this idea of electoral reform. Um, so, as I've mentioned, we focused on young people as a demographic, mostly because they seem to be disinterested or have um, kind of become apathetic to electoral politics. So we want to bring them back into the fold with uh, a targeted campaign that focuses on, on, on electoral reform. And I think the point that we uh, are trying to drive home is that um, while they may not care about politics, politics cares about them. And we need to show them why um, electoral reform is important for them to be able to change the situation that they find themselves in, to be able to um, uh, uh, change uh, uh, the things that they are dissatisfied with. Now, um, I won't go into too much detail about uh, mobilization and, and media and comms, uh, but that I think is where we settled as, as, as the focal point of a campaign coming out of this. Um, there was uh, mention as well of partnering with 
um, organizations such as Amandla.mobi um, popularizing uh, uh, electoral reform as an issue that um, the public need to be aware of as we head into um, the next election. Now, another thing under the topic of political engagement and persuasion that came out of our discussion was that, um, and quite, uh, uh, yeah, was that uh, engagement with political parties is futile. Um, so we, 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 our group felt that uh, we need to start moving away from that um, and engaged more in, 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 in a popular form of politics, um, engaging or putting up a people's manu manifesto for electoral reform, uh, bringing on leaders from um, f uh, other sectors of society like labor, business, and, and fa faith-based organizations, um, and seeing how they can support uh, this effort. And uh, on the last point, uh, on the legal options available, I think we were agreed that we are limited in what we can do legally. Um, however, there was a suggestion that maybe we should look at, uh, as the bill progresses, um, focusing our attention on putting pressure to the president um, to refer that bill to the Constitutional Court um, to address uh, on the basis of, of, of many of its constitutional flaws. Um, and Lawson will be glad to know that apparently CASAC will be uh, coordinating the legal strategy for this. Thank you. And, and on Lawson's behalf, we are very happy to accept um, group three or number three. I'm just giving you a number. I don't know what number you're in. Uh, thank you, everyone. So in our group, we really grappled around whether we should actually be making submissions now in the next two weeks. And part of our concerns were around the fact that perhaps not making a submission is in actual fact making a stronger statement around the fact that we do not support, sorry, around the fact, thank you, that we do not support uh, the minority view. However, we then reached consensus that it makes sense for us to actually make submissions so that when we do intend on challenging some of uh, the provisions within the bill which will then become an act that we, we can refer to those. And then what we decided was that we need immediate action within the next two weeks, but we then need a subsequently larger campaign. Um, and we were in full support of the majority view. Um, and if we were to start a campaign, we would need to cover the following areas, citizen, citizenry or the people, as we call it, the legal aspects around possible constitutional amendments uh, and amendments to the legislation itself, key role players, whether that be political parties and or organized labor and other civil society organizations and communication. And we all noted that this campaign should be supported as much as possible by all organizations, but it was uh, actually pointed out that there are different nuances in different communities, and obviously this affects whether people buy into the possibility of a broader campaign or not. Um, however, we noted that if we have a core message that can speak to what is currently happening in South Africa in terms of the challenges that are faced by citizens, that this would then be the glue that would hold this campaign together. Um, we noted that the reason why we, we'd rather have a core message is because we found that in communities a lot of people don't necessarily understand electoral reform and understand what it would mean in the longer and shorter term for, for South Africa. And so it might be good as a starting point to have a campaign that would deal with the actual issues that people are faced with on a daily basis. And then there was also another idea around designing a 2029 charter of some sort, although not everyone was in full consensus around this, but we thought it might be a good idea to, to have some kind of document or charter that speaks to what we want to achieve around electoral reform. So that's all we covered as, as a group. Thank you. 
I was going to say, not a single report has got any applause. Um, but maybe you will applaud after the last contribution. Um, Khalil? Okay, so we, we discussed um, what media and comms we will need to do to um, uh, you, you talk about these, these key issues. The big thing was uh, developing simple messaging on what Mac 1 and Mac 2, what the Mac 1 and Mac 2 bills are, the importance of them and the implications of each and why it's important to, to support Mac 2. Uh, have workshops with community forums on electoral reform um, and, and important uh, and it would be important that we have uh, discussions on MAC2 and come to a consensus on exactly what the principles uh, within MAC2 that we agree with uh, are and what changes are further needed. Um, it would also be important to tailor uh, specific messaging for the, the kinds of audiences we'd be engaging with. So what messaging would need to go out to the public on electoral reform and then what messaging would need to go out to the political, represent uh, the political representatives that we're going to need to or going to want to engage. Um, it was also key to, we also uh, discussed it would be key to appeal to and build partnerships with media. Um, so. Uh, radio, print, digital, and TV media. Um, can they help to spread these key messages that, that I previously discussed? As well as, uh, can we have work, workshops um, with the media on electoral reform, on what Mac 1, 2, and uh, Mac 1 and Mac 2 are, um, and how to how to go about reporting on 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 Mac 1 and Mac 2, and the importance and relevance of both. In terms of the political engagement. Uh, with political representatives. It would be important to identify current organizations which are already part of this process of public engagement and uh, form a network of support. Uh, it would also be important to petition parliamentarians, have public discourse events uh, similar to the, big, to the big debate with political representatives. Um, <clears throat> that organizations currently here would need to submit inputs um, on the, uh, because there's a, a, a window for a deadline on public submissions on the MAC 1 bill that would be closing on the 16th of September. So before then, uh, have organizations that are currently present here to submit uh, inputs on the principles that they currently support, um, as well as um, anything they disagree with in MAC 1 and, and, and MAC 2. Uh, and then regarding the legal challenge, uh, we discussed the possibility of mounting a legal challenge and interdicting um, this parliamentary process and not either not allow changes happen before, 20, uh, before the 2024 elections um, or force a concourt ruling that would uh, create a pathway for an interim process. Um, so take the current system and make changes to it to ensure it, that it would be constitutional before 2024, make it clear that it's interim and that it has an exp expiry date. Uh, we also discussed it, would it, it wouldn't be enough time to uh, have con a constituency representation to be put in place before 2024, but at least we can create a legally binding pathway for this to be completed by 2029. Uh, regarding the mass uh, mobilization element, uh, we discussed it would it be important to have civic education in communities on the importance of and uh, how to respond to the MAC 1 bill and why we should be opposing it. Um, that accountability lab and mobilize would be key, organize, key civil society organizations to rope in to assist us with community engagement and that uh, we should have train the trainer workshops and basically then deploy these trainers who would be very clued up on electoral reform and the relevance of MAC, MAC 2 into communities to run these civic education programs and workshops. That's it.
thanks to these uh, four, four reports. Thank you very much. It's amazing. I think we have found commonality in, 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 in much of the discussions. So the commonality that emerges from, from, from the reports um, is that we need to make use of the, of the current window for, that's calling for submissions. Uh, we need to do this in an organized way uh, and, and an impactful way. And, and that requires some degree of co coordination amongst all of the organizations who are here. But, but by the way, there's about 130 organizations who had registered to attend uh, this, this particular Indaba. Um, my sense is that many of them were here this morning and, and perhaps would have had to leave uh, by, by the time we, we came to this session. So there's a summary here. Um, the, the general uh, consensus, other than the one that I've spoken about, is there's a, a support for the majority view of the, and we're calling this thing MAC, uh, but with some amendments, because it's the easiest to implement. It's also the minimum basis for electoral reform. And that we need to be clear on what the core points and principles are regarding the majority view. So that requires a lot of work from our side. Make clear that we do not support the minority view. Um, that we need to examine the private mem members bill and look at how close it aligns to what we want out of the MAC majority report. Um, and and if, if necessary, this collective or whoever takes this work forward must look at the possibility of developing a draft bill as, as, an immediate, as immediate work. Convene a task team from the Indaba. Uh, that, that I suppose is something we will come to. There's a need for a mass-based campaign. That mass-based campaign must, must attempt to raise awareness. It needs to show why electoral reform is important and how this links up with the day-to-day -day struggles of people. And, and that essentially is about why politics matters, why the quality of people we put into parliament and provinces are important, and therefore the need to actually have them closer to where you possibly can and the accountability issues then come in. To draw support from labor and other civil society organizations, and, and to make this a societal campaign. It's a campaign that needs millions of people to understand and find some way of showing support. That must be done together with civic education workshops um, in, 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 in communities across the country, and, and training workshops for people who will run those workshops uh, is, is essential. Uh, media is an important point. Uh, partnering with organizations such as Amandla.mobi and others to popularize the issue. And we need to frame the messaging in a way that, that people can understand. Now we are going to have to find, either in this room or outside of this room, people who have the kind of communication skill who can develop a slogan for this kind of, of, of message. What is it in two lines? Because if you're going to go and talk about this on a billboard, what do you want to see? What's, what's that simple message that, that drives home what this is about? And it's a clear message aimed at all role players, which you will tailor to different, uh, to different audiences. It's important that we, we, we engage with the media fraternity in its widest sense to understand this issue and all the complexities. 
similarly to what my vote counts did with, 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 with SANEF uh, around the, the Party Funding Act. They took them away for a weekend, make sure that they understood this. And, and you might well be looking at something similar, but this time beyond SANEF, community media is, is perhaps more, more critical around this kind of work. Political work that we need to do, uh, we need to draw up a report from this, this, this gathering, get as many civil society organizations to, to, to sign it, and then to submit it as a collective response to the parliamentary process. Obviously, tailor it in the kind of language that meets the, the requirements of that parliamentary process. Uh, there's some hesitancy about engaging with political parties and the, the possibilities of a people's manifesto or, or a charter for electoral reform. But I don't think there was outright rejection of the need to engage with the people ultimately that you want to make this decision. Because it's politicians in their political parties that we need to persuade that they need to, to, to make this change. The pressure on the presidency is critical because that's the point where this, this, this bill gets signed into law. And if the president is aware that there are millions of people who says don't sign something that we don't agree with, because there are all of these consequences, then they will have to take that seriously. But that will depend on the ability of all of us who are here and, and those who were here and those who still need to be here to take this message across the length and breadth of South Africa. Uh, and that's linked to the petition to parliamentarians. I mean, it would be nice if all 400 members of parliament were to get a daily WhatsApp message or SMS from us to say, support the bill. Their emails get flooded every day, support the bill. In the church, when they go there, the pastor says, are you supporting, why are you, why are you not coming up with this bill? That kind of pressure from multiple angles must make them rethink, must make them rethink, hopefully. The legal part is really our stronghold. If it were not for the legal challenge that was brought in the Constitutional Court, we would not have been here today. But this is, our, is, is the one thing that I think the IEC is aware of, the presidency and political parties are scared of. None of them would want to see the 2024 elections postponed for any reason or impacted or not necessarily postponed. It is the one tool that we have and we need to use this strategically. Um, amendments to the Constitution, interdicting the parliamentary process, making sure, and then this is where the, the possibilities are, if we can get the 2024 elections as interim, provided there is political and, and, and legal um, sanction, for the change that is required, then it will become interim. Otherwise, this will become the permanent change if, if, the, if it goes through the Constitutional Court. So, so this is what's emerged from the groups, uh, consensus that we do need to make this a mass campaign. We do need to engage, you know, any campaign has a, it's at, it's at an aerial level, that's the battle of ideas, that's the battle of the media and messaging and so forth. Then there's the stuff that you do on the ground, the mass mobilization on the ground. Those two elements, when you get them right, are the success factors of any campaign. And I think more or less that, that's what comes through from the different commissions here. Um, what we will do is to consolidate all of these reports so there's a much more detailed action plan beyond just the, the, the PowerPoint that you have here. Um, and that the convening organizations of this session would, would, would have a responsibility to pull that together, to communicate that back to all of the organizations who showed an interest in this meeting, and then to figure out how to implement this program and who can do what 
not necessarily only those five organizations, but everybody else who's here must be communicated back to to say, this is the program, what help can we get from you, and how do we extend the base of these five organizations to every other organization that has got the time, energy, skills, expertise to become part of a campaign structure to drive this to, to go forward. Um, that, that's the one option. The other option is to say, we've done our work here. Every organization must go back and do what they can. And you know what that means? If there's nobody that picks up the phone tomorrow and says, have you done one, two, and three? We're probably not going to do it. So that's the summary. I, uh, I'm hoping the summary covers all of the views from all of the commissions. I'm going to open up to a few comments from any group that feels your ideas or suggestions or conclusions of your group have not been reflected. This is not a time to punt new ideas, but if your group had agreed on something that was not reported on accurately, this is the time to make those kinds of corrections. Any takers? One hand there. Thank you very much. Um, agree with 99.9% uh, .9 of it. There's just one element in it, and that is that in our group we had quite a discussion around do we accept the MAC report? Um, and we said we cannot accept the MAC report as is, um, but we can accept the principles contained in the MAC report, and that's quite an important difference because there are a number of organizations that have got other models on the table but are aligned with the same sort of principles of bringing it closer to the people, constituency-based, etc., compensatory list, but not the MAC report model as such everybody agrees with, but the principles of the MAC report we agree with. Now, let's, let's note that there is that, that slight difference and that there is a counter view of probably the majority of people for ease of simplicity, for the fact that it, that, 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 that the, it went through a process and if we have to get things done immediately, it doesn't mean to start a whole new inquiry into examining all other kinds of models for which if we have the time, we can do. If we don't have the time, then, 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 then there is the, the, the one report that I think the majority of people here are, are in agreement with. But, but let's note that, that particular difference. Anybody else? I see a hand there. As I said, it must be stuff that, before you start, no. this is not a time to open up for new points. It must be something that was this discussed and was, agreed to in your group. No, yeah. This is what was, was in the group. Yeah, carry on. Okay, yeah, this is what was in the group. And that is that we should treat the by-elections as a opportunity and a focus and try to turn them into national events through the media for accountability and exactly what we're trying to do. So it's for the by-elections and that would be ongoing, not up and just up until December 22, but ongoing. Okay. Noted. Anybody else? No, we're done. I want to thank all of you. What happens from here? All of this work will be consolidated. The organizations that convene this will put together a report, submit that to all of yourselves with a program of action, and then appeal to those who want to work with those who have convened you here today to take forward that program and, and start the implementation. Now we have a program, we need to implement it it, the work needs to be done beyond the five that have convened you here today. So I'm hoping the five organizations that have convened you are in agreement with us. Faisal? You happy? Lukona, Tessa? Fine. Kesek? Okay. Uh, my vote counts? Okay. Right. The Kathrada Foundation is also fine. Um, you all deserve a round of applause for and particularly to people here.
We're now, I think, slightly back on track in time for the closing address by Vali Musa. Uh, we call it the MAC majority. Uh, fortunately, it was not MAC Maraj that was busy drafting this report. Otherwise, it would have had other kinds of connotations. Uh, Vali, I'm not going to introduce you, but let's get your remarks here, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sean, and good afternoon to everybody who is present here. My apologies that I could not join you earlier today. I had to be chairing a session of the Presidential Climate Commission. Uh, I'd like to just, uh, uh, for the record, state that I am talking here in my personal capacity. Now, free and fair elections. This is one of the greatest successes of the South African democracy. The new electoral system under consideration by Parliament at present should alarm all of us because the proposed system, as it stands, places this monumental achievement of the freedom struggle at risk. The new proposed system is complex to understand, complicated to implement, and less fair than the current electoral systems that we have at the national, provincial, and municipal level. The right of people, the people of South Africa, to choose their own government is the constant heartbeat that keeps our democracy alive. To tinker with this is to tinker with the lifeblood of our democracy. And we must warn the, our parliamentarians to tread very very carefully when they start tinkering with the right to vote. Because our Constitution, as we all know, entrenches human rights. The Bill of Rights in the Constitution can only be amended by a supermajority of two-thirds. Since we became a democracy, the Bill of Rights has not been changed. There was one attempt with the attempt to change the Bill of Rights as concerns property rights, and that attempt failed. Because the Constitution makes it extremely difficult for any set of parliamentarians to tinker with what is the heart and soul of our democracy. But the Constitution, in its very first clause, does more than talk about the Bill of Rights. It sets out the values of our country and the values of the Constitution. So it's got different things. It's got Bill of Rights and it's got values. And the whole set of values in the Constitution is set out in about seven lines, in one clause. There are four values in our Constitution. The one is human dignity. The second is non-racialism and non-sexism. The third is the supremacy of the rule of law. And the third is universal adult suffrage, a common voter's role, regular elections, a multi-party system of democratic government to ensure accountability, responsiveness, and openness. Now, when it comes to these, these four values, the Constitution says Parliament needs a majority of 75 percent 
the highest majority needed to amend these values. In fact, there's hardly a jurisdiction anywhere in the world that requires such a high majority to amend anything. And the reason for this is because the founders of our country had decided that these values should never be changed. It should not be possible for any parliament to take a democratic decision that there will no longer be regular elections, for example, or that there will no longer be non-racialism. And at the time of the drafting of the Constitution, we colloquially referred to this as the unalterable clause of the Constitution. Now, we, we can talk a lot about the bill before Parliament. It's a big bill with a lot of stuff in there, very dense. And we can talk about the report of the committee which I had chaired. But when we talk about the vote, let's not get lost completely in the technicalities of this matter. Because this isn't, we're not a set of lawyers. When we talk about the vote, we must look at what our Constitution says in its values. It says accountability, responsiveness, and openness. And if we want to improve our current electoral system, then it must be a new system which promotes an open democracy which is accountable and responsive. The biggest weakness of our current system is that our members of parliament are not chosen by the voters. That is the biggest, forget uh, all the technicality, Sean. The voters don't choose these people. You can sometimes see somebody on TV and ask yourself, but who on earth in their right mind would have voted for that man? You wonder. Because, frankly, voters, when they go to the voting station, they are supposed to be sober. By the way, it's illegal to go to a voting station if you are drunk. They are supposed to be sober. And a sober person will not choose many of the people that we've got there. So this is what we want to improve. We want to, um, we want to have a better quality of members of parliament that are chosen by the people. We also want voters to feel empowered. Every election, fewer and fewer people are going to vote. And one of the reasons for that is people feel, you speak to ordinary people, they say, oh, whether I vote or I don't vote, nothing will happen, things won't change. In other words, they don't feel empowered. They don't feel it's in their hands to put Mr. X and Mrs. Y into Parliament. They don't feel it's in their hands. And so you want a system that will once again make voters, uh, empower voters and make them believe that they are empowered. That I think is at the heart of what we're trying to do. We're trying to empower voters. We're trying to say that Mr. Member of Parliament you must present yourself to the voters and let the voters decide whether they're going to vote for you or maybe for somebody who is opposing you. But right now, voters cannot do that. It is quite unbelievable that so far Parliament has rejected public opinion. The government has had appointed over the past 20 years three expert bodies to advise on how to improve the electoral system, and Parliament has rejected the advice of all three bodies. It's quite amazing. Now, let me talk a little bit about why I believe that the electoral system being considered by Parliament right now is a disaster in waiting. 
Firstly, it is a completely new electoral system that has that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. By the way, this kind of electoral system or even a version of it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. It's not what some proponents of the system of the new, of the proposed system say. It is not a multi member constituency system. That is a different thing. This is not a multi-member constituency system. As you know, there has been a number of very credible arguments that we have 60 or 70 or 100 multi-member constituencies. This is not a multi, this is not multi because in a multi-member constituency, you vote for the number of members that that constituency sends to parliament. According to this system, in the Eastern Cape, there will be 63 members sent to, to Parliament, but uh, you will only be able to vote for one, unless you vote for a political party. So it's, it's a system that hasn't been tried and tested. The unintended consequences are not known, and there is no political analysis that I have seen Nothing, nothing coming from anybody, not the government and not the majority party or any other party. <clears throat> the second important thing that this bill creates as a problem is proportional representation. Our constitution says that any electoral system must result in a proportional outcome because it's a modern constitution. It's only archaic systems like in the United Kingdom where the majority can vote for one party, but a party that, that gets less votes can become the government. <coughs> That's an archaic system. That's why our constitution says proportional. This proposed system goes against the prim principle of proportional representation because what it does is that when an independent candidate in the Eastern Cape gets 500,000 votes, about 450,000 of those votes will be discarded, will be thrown away. And so proportionality means that it's consti parliament is constituted in proportion with the will of the people, in proportion with the way in which people have voted. The third big problem is that it's a complicated system. Now, you know, when our new constitution was drafted, it was drafted in what is called plain language. Because we asked ourselves at that time, do we need to write the constitution in using half the words in Latin and the other half words in Greek? Or can we just write it in English and Afrikaans and Zulu and all of that in plain language and a person who is not a lawyer should be able to read it and see what it says. <coughs> Any of us here can pick up the Constitution and read it because it's quite clear. This bill, I don't know how many of you have read the bill and read the, 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 the bill is a proposed amendment to the Electoral Act and then there are also proposed amendments to the proposed amendment bill. Here it is. Try to read it. I'm <laughs> the people who, are vo who plan to vote for this, for this bill don't understand it. Do you know that the majority of the members of parliament, of the EFF, DA and the ANC don't know what is in this bill. And, and how do I know? Because I speak to them. Uh, they listed me for this meeting as an activist. By the way, it's not completely wrong. Because I call these people up. I say, by the way, comrade so-and-so, I see you're supporting this bill. Can you explain to me why you think it's the right thing? And the person would inevitably say, look, let me be frank with you, Comrade Vali, I haven't read it. I don't, I don't really understand it myself. It's just that it was a decision. So in, and not only in the ANC, I've got, I know people in all of these parties that I call up. They don't understand it. 
As far as the ANC is concerned, the party of which I am a member, the majority of the members of the National Executive Committee do not know what the new il proposed electoral system is. I've actually spoken to them myself, because I know all of them, I've called all of them. As you say, I'm an activist, I've called all of them. They don't know what's in this bill. And when I tell them some of the things that are in a the bill, they say they are surprised. This is a very, very dangerous situation that we are in. It's like a person driving a truck but has fallen asleep at the wheel because you are fiddling with the most important right in our constitution, the right to vote. The, the fourth point I'd like to make is that there is a principle in our system which says one person, one vote of equal value. And that's an important principle of our struggle. Because when we were, camp we were fighting in the struggle for one person, one vote, P.W. Bertha said, okay, let's give them all one person, one vote. The whites will vote for the white parliament, the Indians will vote for the House of Delegates, the Coloreds will vote for the House of Representatives, and the Africans will vote for this or that Bantustan. Everybody, one person, one vote. That's what he said. They argued it, they actually did argue. <coughs> So in the struggle, our demand was one person, one vote of equal value. This new proposed system takes that away. Because if 50,000 people, I mean 500,000 people in the Eastern Cape vote for Mr. X, they only get one person in parliament. If 500,000 people vote for the EFF in the Eastern Cape, they will probably get about eight or nine members of parliament in. So the principle of one person, one vote of equal value will be taken away. I cannot, for the life of me, see the constitutional court saying that this passes constitutional muster. It will be shot down uh, by the constitutional court. And then, of course, there's the question of uh, 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 the voting system. If you want people, if you want free and fair elections, and if you really want it to be free, then it must be easy for people to vote, not difficult. You're going to go into a voting station, and there will be a voting paper with about 50 or 60 or 100 political parties listed, and probably 1,000 independent candidates. And then you have to decide You'll go through the pages, and you have to decide where to put your ax. I'm not exaggerating on this, because if you take the 2021 local government elections, there were a total of 11,237 registered candidates, registered candidates, in the Eastern Cape alone, in that province, 11,000. Let's suppose only 10% of them do all the hard work to register as candidates, for, as members of parliament. Then you've got 1,000 independent candidates in the Eastern Cape. The voter will be mesmerized. It becomes so complex and complicated that what is the point of doing this thing anyway? There are some people who have referred to this proposed system that parliament is considering as a minimalistic system. That's a euphemism. There's nothing minimalistic about it. This is an extremely complex system that has been put forward. So, friends, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say, I think we have a duty to point out to the public that actually the members of parliament, by their own admission, have no idea what they're doing. There are many things about which they have no idea, but this is a serious matter. This is about the right to vote. They themselves say they have no idea what they are doing, and they should be stopped. Thank you very much. So, so there you have it. But one, one idea that struck me as Vali was speaking 
I think all of us need to be calling up members of parliament and to ask them to explain this bill that they are putting before parliament for approval. You know, that there are constituency offices across the country. We can actually go to every constituency office and say, explain this thing to us and record, record their responses to this to show up their inability to understand what they're talking about. Because I think that that is the pressure that we need. This is a moment for, or, or, or this, this, this issue allows possibly for the first time since the drafting of the Constitution for a mass, a national mass political campaign. Not where we're going to people to ask them to vote for a particular country, but we ask, we, would, we need to engage people about the kind of electoral system that brings about, that links to the issues that affect their day-to-day -day lives, so that in that process, you, we actually begin to rebuild confidence and trust in politics and the ability of people to get back involved so that we, we break this notion that we are powerless to do anything about the many issues that, that affect us. And I think that that's the opportunity that we, are, we, we, we have before us here. And it's on that note, and I hope I speak for all of the organizations that have brought us here, that we will seriously look at all of the, the recommendations that have come out today, communicate back with yourselves as a matter of urgency, broaden the scope of involvement around implementing this campaign with a hope that we will, we, will, we will commit to doing this work across the length and breadth of the country. I don't know where the money will come from, but that is, I think, what our intention needs to be. And on that note, I think we've done today's work. I want to thank all of you, especially those who've flown in today, this is only the start of a long haul. Uh, and it is likely that this Indaba would have to be reconvened to take stock of where we are at, at, at a point probably before the end of the year so that we map out if there's work that needs to be carried over into 2023 as well. Can I just thank all of you for your attendance, your participation, your time and energy and commitment here today to the sound people, the video recorders, the, the, the photographers, the caterers, to the, the staff of all of these organizations who've really made today possible, and to all of you, our speakers, our facilitators, uh, I think it has been a very empowering gathering. And as Vali says, this is an opportunity to talk about voter empowerment. Uh, people's empowerment through voter empowerment through a new electoral system. I think that that's where the possibilities of our slogan will lie. Thank you very much.